Hello everybody and welcome to another Royal Room Rumble with yours truly, Mark Reed. And today we're going back to, um, well this was actually a one I did a while ago and I was sort of, um, I was holding on to it. I've, I've been... I've been kind of all over the place at the moment. I've I've been um trying to do something. It hasn't been working. So um I, I'm gonna put this up to to give some content in the meantime, and hopefully it, sort of you can forgive me for sort of being distracted and working on something um that I'm trying to make work. Um, but I, I do appreciate your patience. And this was going to um, uh, Stephen Boland's room again. Um, a Christian, one of the uh people from. Uh, his room had had actually been on my channel and was was good to talk to, and this was a really interesting talk, and it did cover um, morality and and the way that that I see morality and sort of some different different opinions about it and different sort of um, the one thing that I do get is that um, it it really feels like to me, and this could be my perception, but it really feels like to me that that none of the Christians have ever had any kind of secular moral system actually explained to them by somebody that follows that moral system or um, has an understanding of that moral system. Um, it seems like they misinterpret a lot of, of sort of what is understood by secular humanism and, and why we adhere to secular humanism and what it entails. Um, they sort of have this idea that everything is about the um, sort of enjoyment of yourself to the detriment of others. And, and I think this is reinforced in churches so I'm I'm really happy that I get to sort of go into these rooms and talk to these people and say, hey, you know, n not everything I do is done for me. A lot of it, the things that I do is done for humanity in general. And that's what I'm trying to do in my own small way as much as I can. So, um, but, you know, there was definitely some pushback, definitely some differences of agree uh, uh, of position. Um, but, you know, a really good conversation, a really interesting conversation with some, um, you know, sort of people from uh, the other end of the spectrum on the uh, faith front. So, um, yeah, I hope you enjoy. I hope you get something out of it. And um, I've got another one to come from the, the same room, which I've sort of been enjoying the conversations with them. I, I do want to sort of get more onto the science and, and sort of how we know uh, what what is true is true and how we use a scientific method so um look out for that but for the moment let's get ready to rumble what do you think how is like, you more do accurate? that i mean it's, I, it's probably you impossible how, how do humans, you but, but I how could you right. i agree with you yeah i didn't you think possibly, possibly remove yeah but at least you have the intention of trying to do so of trying to Correct. leave your biases at the door um the the problem that I see with um, and don't get me wrong I just want to address something that Captain Sum said I certainly don't think Christians are stupid you know like there's there's a ton of Christians who are incredibly smart and incredibly well learned um, I just dr disagree with them on some of the the sort of presuppositions that they make and you know what they believe that doesn't mean they're stupid I I I get you some atheists think that but I think that's a pretty general statement to think that all atheists think that. Um, on, on that, like, and, and we try to leave our biases at the door, but there is a segment of um, creationists, especially the youngest creationists, who will start with the Bible. Like, they won't start at science. They won't start at let's gather the evidence. They will start at the Bible. And they've well, got Mark, no intention of leaving that. That's called that. faith for Christians. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was going to say that's a fair statement, <laughs> but I'm okay with it. Fair I'm okay um, with it too. Well, I I, I, I want to also ask what you mean by faith, because I've heard a lot of different definitions depending on who I'm talking with. Um, you know, I get the, the Bible one, you know, the, the evidence of things unseen, and I get ones that are more like confidence in something. And, and I was wondering what your definition of faith would be. Yeah, for me, uh, my faith means that I know who God is. He's revealed himself to me, and I believe that the Bible as presented to me is his word and that it's the truth. Um, that's well, my faith. I, 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 yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's a definition of faith. It's more just describing what it, what it, I guess, what it means to you in sort of a, a personal sense. Well, um, yeah. Mark, that's, that's always important. I, I don't care about definition. I care about what does it mean to me? Right. That is because this is a personal thing. The faith is personal. I can't put faith on anybody else or tell him this is how you can, this is how you obtain faith. No, it's gotta be each person individual. Yeah. But what you've described sort of everybody, 
has that that faith that that it means something to them personal and that that they believe that it's true so somebody who's a, a, a it, it follows islam that does a suicide bombing they have faith as well and obviously they're not coming to the the, mm -hmm. the right conclusion so how does faith help you in coming to the correct conclusion then well i said i have the faith that god is who he is and he's revealed himself to me and that I believe that this is his word, so I trust it. Mark. A hundred percent. Yeah, no, I faith. get that. But how do you... And so, I mean... Go ahead. But, but how do you the distinguish school. between somebody that has faith and that leads them to the right thing and somebody that has faith that they're right? And Because what you've described doesn't... Like, there's no way to use that to get to what is what is reality. All that All that happens is you think you can't be wrong. Not necessarily. I mean, every, everybody's individual. Like I said, the Muslim guy thinks that what his, his Quran says is what he should do yes. is okay. That's his, that's his opinion. We're all individuals. And you, uh, science, you know, a guy who's scientific minded is probably carnal minded, and they have to be shown proof of everything. I'm sorry, what minded? For a, a Christian like me, it takes God to show himself to me, and then for me to believe that his word is where it's at and that I should follow it. I'm sorry. Has to be individual. Faith can be a, a blanket. Minded. I missed that completely. Science minded was Mark, is, is what the I Bible may. would call carnal minded. I mean, you have to have proof of everything. You have to have like physical proof of everything. Well, through, uh, yes. Well, I mean, um, it's not proof. Essentially, it's not the greatest. Well, one at a time, guys. The Christian has is their own personal testimony. Right, and but that's I'm why it's so important if you are a Christian to give your testimony, and that's why. A couple of months ago, what, two or three months ago now, Proverbs? Uh, Maybe, Proverbs I'm sure. and another friend, both independently, told me that they wanted to put me on their channels and start giving my testimony. And both of these guys came up with the idea independent of one another at the same time. <laughs> and so that told me something right there. It said, right. okay, well, I've never done this before, and I'm a little bit shy, and I'm a little bit this and that and the other, but mm -hmm. this God wants me to do it, so I'm going to do it. You know, so yeah just, yeah but when you have sort of testimony from from other religions you have a lot of people from islam a lot mm -hmm. of people from hindu a lot of people um out there all giving different and varied testimonies um neither neither mm -hmm. testimony nor nor faith um and especially faith it doesn't seem to get mm -hmm. you to the truth reliably because everybody seems to be using the same mechanism of faith like i'm going to put my mm -hmm. trust and confidence in this thing and that's what it means personally to me but it doesn't seem to get us to any reliable result because people that are doing mm -hmm. that come up with all kinds of answers that are in conflict with one another so when you're talking about science you're talking about methodology right you're talking about the methods in which we use something so that can be things like rigorous like how do we get it so that everybody gets the same answer how do we get it so that all possibilities are covered um, how do we get it so that um, if, if i do this use the same um, methods i will get the same answer as anybody else and that's essentially what right. we're doing the problem is that that what you've described faith and and sort of testimony don't get us to reliable results they get us to very varied results Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think faith is meant to get you all to the same result. It's not meant to that. It's an individual personal well, thing, like you said. It, I will it can't say that, cover yes, everybody. Many, it can't cover there everybody. Many, there are many faiths out there. There are many religions, mm -hmm. but there is one thing that sets Christianity apart from every single other one. It's this that Christianity is grace-based. It's all about what God does for us, whereas the other religions, how can I do enough good things to please God? How can I work my way up to heaven? Every other faith is works based. Yeah, I get I'm that. But they'll, they'll say there's other things about their religion that yours don't have, so their religion must be considered the thing. The the whole That's point true, about say that. yeah, the the whole point about science. Could you give that, an example? Well, the 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 Muslims will say that sort of the the you know Christian faith has become corrupted. Theirs is the only one. Theirs makes a sim uh, you know number of predictions like about AIDS, about water, about all kinds of things. That are obviously, you know, supernatural predictions. Couldn't have possibly known this back then. Um, you know, I don't know if you've interacted with many Muslims, but they say this kind of thing all the time, and that that shows that that the Bible was corrupted and theirs is the correct book, etc., etc. Et I, I don't have a dog in the race, quite frankly. I don't, 
you know, I don't believe mm-hmm. them at all, but I, you know, I don't believe you guys at all. So I, I don't have one that I'm going for here. What I'm saying is that out of all of these things, the same claims come about them. So how do we evaluate which ones have merit and which ones don't in an, in an objective kind of way, you know, in a way that we all get the same answer. And there seems to, as, as Cam Stump says, there seems to be no way to do it, um, which is why the, um, the, we sort of don't try to bring in our biases. Um, there, be- there is evidence for the truth of the Bible. Um, sure. There were many, I, I forget how many, many prophecies made in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the New Testament uh, concerning Jesus. Uh, did Proverbs, do you know how many? Stump, anybody? Christian? I know how it's many? like 4,400 prophecies total now that have been fulfilled. Well, okay. Yeah, this- it's a very high number. Yeah, and, and there's there's problems I have with that. Um, for instance, some of the prophecies are like, you know, he rode through a donkey through the gates of Jerusalem. And it's it's sort of, well, somebody that knows that prophecy, it's not exactly hard to fulfill. And, you know, it, millions of people have rode through the gates of Jerusalem on a donkey. You know, that's not even up for question. That's That's something that's back then would have been an everyday occurrence. It might even happen today still um, if somebody owns a donkey and lives in, in Israel. Um, so a lot of them are pretty uh, mundane kind of uh, um, sort yeah. of predictions. Um, I understand them... when you don't have like any Hebrew context, even the one with the donkey, the example you just gave kind of seems a little mundane, uh-huh. but it's actually so much richer than that. You know, the Bible describes a donkey that hadn't yet been ridden, and it points that out because the the royal bloodline in Jerusalem – had donkeys. It's the same bloodline of donkeys that King David had his son Solomon march down to be anointed king on. Mm -hmm. Uh, Only the king and the royal family could ride these donkeys. So the donkey that the Messiah rode in on was actually reserved for the royal bloodline of King David. So why didn't the Jewish people... It's not really that mundane. Why didn't the Jewish people believe it? Well, there's a whole lot of messianics that turned into Christians that did. Yeah, so so the people at the time who would have sort of seen this at the time didn't believe it. Rabbi, They've got no way to check whether it actually happened or not. Um, that That's the problem. There's a whole load of people that saying, no, he wasn't Messiah. And the people who lived there said he wasn't Messiah. The Jewish people still don't believe he was the Messiah. So there's some problems there with, with sort of the... Um, the, the, the um, um, you know, the, the people that were awaiting this Messiah didn't believe he was the one. So there's some problems there. Um, a lot of the prophecies, like, for instance, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, um, the idea that um, that the Bible has that, that um, people had to return to their place of birth to a Roman census, if you understand the Roman system of census, that's, that didn't happen. The, the Romans didn't require you to go back to your place. Of, no, no census ever, either when the Romans were doing them to today, ever required people to go. Like, what, what's the point of a census where you leave where you actually live? That's called an inaccurate census. And, uh, census. and the Romans weren't stupid. They, they tried to get an idea of who lived in their empire and where. Having people return to the place of their birth is nonsensical for a census. Um so th- this is sort of a, a inconsistency where he had to be born in Bethlehem, and it seems like there's a story saying, well, Mary had to go to Bethlehem, and they sort of had a reason for it. But the reason makes no sense whatsoever. Well, Scripture also describes it as being a tax. That would make sense if it was a tax as well as a census. They were going to tax you, so they wanted to where you where town you came from, so they can keep records of who was taxed and who wasn't taxed. That makes sense. How does that make sense? I would also, the, the whole world I would, was taxed. I would, also, I would also point out that at the time that the New Testament was starting to be spread around, it was very recent after that time. So the fact that we don't have in recorded history any big uprise of people saying, hey, this never happened with Herod, I find that kind of odd. Well, I mean, the, the, the Bible that we have isn't the original copies, is it? They are reliable copies. Yes, well, they're not the original. There's a there's a chain of there's a chain of custody. Well, we know from certain passages, like the end of Mark, for instance, that was added later, and we know this because there's copies without the handling of snakes and talking of tongues in them. 
we know that's been added by the Christian faith after the fact. And the fact that we don't have the originals means that we don't know what has been added and what hasn't been. And yes, it's an it, it's it's a, it's a very good chain of, of custody back to where where we have the earliest copies. But at that point, we don't know because we don't have the originals. Like, how could you possibly know if anything's been changed or anything's been added or not added? Because before we found the older text, people thought well, that the what I find of odd, what I find, what I find, what I find uh -huh. odd though, Mark, is that we have mm -hmm. way more text about Jesus Christ than we have about like Julius Caesar. But you have no problem believing the validity of Julius Caesar's accounts. Well, I don't believe all of the claims in it. I think that Julius Caesar sort of, you know, um, I think that there were claims floating around that he was, uh, you know, as a, as a Roman emperor, he was a god, you know, in, in spirit kind of thing. Um, and and um, I, I don't believe those claims. I don't think Julius Caesar was some sort of, you know, Roman deity, you know, person sent sent by, uh, uh, you know, Remus and Romulus to, to, you know, conquer the lands kind of thing. But I do believe he was a person because there's a lot of um, extra sources that he existed. Now, did he have all the victories he was claimed to have? Maybe he didn't. I, I don't know. But sort of a a um, a a person like that, it's it's a pretty mundane claim that there was an emperor of Rome that was called Caesar, and there's a lot of documents to to clarify that, and that he sort of you know um, um, went went out to conquer lands. I think there's a lot of uh, documents for that as well. Do I believe some of the more and sort of larger Mark, claims? No. Mark, yeah. one of the beautiful things that Adolf Hitler's lawyers in that, that, trail, that trial that they had, Nuremberg. they tried to do was they tried to make a bunch of deniers. Nuremberg. Right? They, they made this is 110% like Swatswika truth. Uh, what? Sorry? It's 110% <laughs> what? Shut up, dude. What I'm saying is, is that it's easier to play with the evidence than you're letting on. Well, I, I said it's easy to play with evidence. I, I brought up how the church added the at the end of Mark. I, I can't remember what the name of that section was. I can look it up if you want. Um, I can't believe Christian Pike has nothing to comment on this section. Like it, it's mine. I'm sorry. I've been arguing with Mike in the chat. <laughs> Gotta let that guy go, Christian. I know gotta, I gotta let, let him go. go. I gotta let him go. Hey, Mark. I hope hey, you're doing well. Hey, buddy. Christian. Yeah, I'm well. I'm just early, but um, yeah, I'm I'm still getting my brain into gear, but that's okay. It's all right. Thank thanks for the invite too. I really appreciate it. It's always fun to come on and um, have a back and forth. Um, Mark, if you don't mind, what time of day is it there? Right. Uh, it's eight o'clock in the morning. Last I checked. Yeah, quarter past eight. Okay. See. Yeah. Okay. So here it's eight in the evening. Just kind of interesting. Yeah, so it's my like, ignorant American so you're, you're Saturday, Saturday there morning. now, right? Yeah, Mark? Saturday morning. Okay, yeah. yeah, Saturday morning, Saturday well, morning. Yeah. yeah, high from the future. Yeah, sure, sure. And and <laughs> you're literally starting your day off with a whole bunch of Christians and Grayson. Yeah, why not? And Grayson. I why I have not? to confess something to you, Mark. Yeah. From the times I've seen you on Standing for Truth with Ken mm -hmm. Hoven, mm -hmm. I always mm -hmm. thought you were really an a hole, but after having you on my show. And I've had to be honest and evaluate yeah. kind of how sometimes Ken Hoven likes to antagonize. Sure. And I have to say, since you've been on my show, man, you've been a perfect gentleman, and I appreciate that. And I was wrong. I don't think you're an a-hole when you're oh, not look, antagonized. Um, so, Mark so, is a very nice girl. Okay, so, so what you've got to understand is when you go into a debate, you are literally setting your ideas against other people's. You're literally... You have an enemy. Well, it, 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 it's kind of like you're, you're pitting your ideas and really trying to strike down, you know, like, you know, there's a reason why they call an attack in, in sort of debate because you I get it, questions. Mark. Shoot them. Yeah, well, yeah, come on now. Um, I don't. Mark. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but sort of when I have discussions, I'm a lot more laid back than when I'm actually in debate because in debate, I'm going to say, here are my ideas. Yours has got to stand against mine. Um, whereas more in discussions, I can say, hey, I, you know, you can disagree if you want. I don't care. I, I just, you know, that's fine. Uh, debates are completely different beast than just having a discussion. I, th hey, I think that, Eli, um, I think that people a, see debates and they sort of go, oh, well, this person hates the other person. It's, it's, no, no, not at all. Not at all. Um, 
I will say I agree with that, but there are people that come out of the gate swinging and, and are unnecessarily hostile. Oh, Professor yeah. Dave, I love that guy, but he's a he's a real aggressive yeah, debater. Professor Dave is a jerk in debates. And I would say jerk, guy. but he's an aggressive debater. Uh, he's definitely aggressive. Yeah, I, I will concede that. Yeah, I, I I think that um some people I think that they've done it so long that they they sort of get jaded and and sort of they will swing without without even thinking about it because that's you know, I think that's right. Yeah. That they sort of they've been in it so long. Um, you know, Matt Delahunt is another guy. He's been doing it so long. I think he just swings automatically, kind of thing. And that's just, you know, and some people have different styles and, and that's okay. I mean, it's, it's not like I'm, I'm afraid to roll around in the mud with somebody kind of thing. It's, it's, it's fine. I just, I, I like, I like a nice cordial debate. I mean, I had one with um Paul, um, oh, what was he off? Paul, was it Paul Price? I think it was. And that was a lovely, that, that was awesome. That was a great debate. Like just a, just a, you know, really cordial back and forth. I, I really, there are a few jabs here and there, but you know, I, I thought it was fun. It was good. So um yeah I really enjoyed interacting with Paul. It was a, a really good time. Okay. Well yeah. Well we appreciate having you around here too. You're always yeah, no a gentleman. Uh, my pleasure. And I I like that we can all agree to disagree. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Like here's the thing. Like when when we're looking at sort of um I mean most of the arguments that, that get really heated come from a different in in worldview on on certain topics when morality doesn't equate to one another and and i really love talking about morality i really love it so engaging on that subject um i i i have the opinion that secular morality is is superior than than religious morality um and you can you can disagree but at the end of the day um as long as people's morality is compatible it's it's fine like as long as we can sort of agree, hey, we shouldn't kill people and we shouldn't steal from people, and, you know, all of these things, then we can live together in a society. That's not a problem. Um, it, it's when, you know, there's there's somebody saying, hey, um, I get to go around and, you know, harm these other people. That's that's when we have the problem that, that you know. Where do you think, though, um, through evolution, we would get that objective morality? So that murdering I don't, is bad. Yeah, so I'm I, I'm I'm sort of a, uh, a to use a sort of technical term. I'm a meta ethical relativist, um, which is to say that what does that mean in English? Right, 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 right. So which is to say that I I don't think there's any objective, um, there's no objective goal for morality in the universe. Like mor basically, I don't think that the universe or anything in it or anything objective, independent of a mind says that we have to do something right we have to do this or have to do that um i think that um humans in general because we are a social sort of animal we um we have things that make us um safe basically so if if you want um to have a good life if you want to be happy if you if you care about well-being then there's certain things you ought to do in order to get that um, if you don't care in human well-being, if you don't care in society, um, that's usually when society will remove you from it. Um, so, um, but what if somebody enjoyed murdering? Yeah, that's where if your your um, sort of intersubjective goals don't align with the rest of society, you're usually removed from society. Oh, so it's kind of basing morality off of like public opinion. Um, public majority that that's kind of well, sketchy it's, don't it's, you think well it's not really basing it on on public opinion it's basing it upon what what you want the goal to be um i so if if you have a goal of well-being like i do there's certain things that we can objectively say are good for your well-being and bad for your well-being if, if isn't that putting a dangerous amount of trust though um well, in here, believing that it's correct here, here's the thing, mate. There's, there's no um, like I would like there to be some kind of objective sort of overarching thing, but I don't think there is. I don't believe there is. That that's that's the point. Um, whether or not I want there to be an objective morality or not is independent of whether there is or not. And even the people claiming objective morality don't have access to it. So. Um, for instance, you might claim that the Bible has objective morality. Well, that that's great, but someone had to write it, and someone has to interpret it. 
leading to all kinds of different outcomes, which isn't objective anymore. So even if there is objective morality, which I see no reason to believe there is, um, there's there's no um, th there's no objective morality in our society. So we're still relying on public opinion, um, and the public opinion is people's interpretation of holy texts. But isn't that cases. putting faith in the fact that the majority is correct? Like, well, it's, what happened? I mean, okay, and yeah. the South proves that wrong. The, the Southern United States before the Civil War, sure. the majority of the population in the South thought slavery was no big deal. Uh, that it was just an inherent right for yeah, white no, people can, to own someone of a wrong. lesser race, what they considered. Yeah, so so those populations... But the majority is supposed yeah. to form morality. Yeah, so those populations, um, they weren't moral by even their own standards. Because when, when you have a goal under meta-ethical uh, relativism, like when you have a goal, like for instance, let's let's take, you know, let's, uh, uh, you know, go to the Nazis because that's a good example. Theirs was to establish the third right kind of thing. Now, the actions they took um, were, were actually against that goal. It was objectively harmful to establishing that, what they did, because the rest of the world would never allow that to happen. It was a really dumb idea. Um, it was really antithetical to what they were trying to achieve because um, basically everybody turned against them, and rightly so. Um, there, there was no way they were going to achieve what they wanted to achieve. So I, I can sort of say, hey, it really, was Christian, it was nothing. But but it has to that has to be. Hey, hold on, I was typing an email. I'm sorry. What was the question? You aren't typing an email. You were back and forth with Mike. No, this time I wasn't. I was typing an email. But um, Mike's gonna get it here in a minute. I'm trying to defend the faith so, against Mark all by myself, and you're the smart one, Christian. Are we you're having about a, you're having a thumb so, war battle with Mike. Mm -hmm. Okay, are we talking about relativistic morals versus absolute morals? Is that the thing? No, okay. right now we're debating on whether or not Samson was mm -hmm. a possibility. Well, I mean, absolute morality what? is is uh, is that something you subscribe to, Christian? Um, that's a very interesting question. Uh, there. Hold on, Bubs is yelling. Give me two seconds. Okay, so, um, so this is evolution is a sub. Hold tight, Dustin. Hold tight. Um, can y'all hear me? Sure. Yes. Okay, because Bubs was yelling. Okay, so it's obvious that the scriptures give us a layout of things that society ought to accept and not accept. Now, that's more or less in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it just deals with the church. God don't really care about society anymore. In the Old Testament, he kind of deals with society as a whole, whereas in the New Testament, he just deals with the church and says everybody else is going to hell anyways. So if we look at how he deals with the church, he's very stringent with the expectations of the church, but those really don't translate to society in general because he could care less about society in general. He's going to burn them all. So my point in saying that in such a dramatic way is that the idea of Christian nationalism is foolishness. Because there's no such thing as a Christian nation. Christianity is a vow of poverty, and a nation is an economy. It's a business. And so they're, they're starkly in opposition one with the other. This is why I don't subscribe to Christian nationalism, because if you had a Christian nation, it would give everything away to the poor. That's, that's what Christianity commands us to do. It commands us to be servants to our fellow man. And so the idea of having a Christian nation is almost an oxymoron. Now, I understand like having a nation— well, it is like communism. Uh, actually, the only true variant of New Testament society would be true heartfelt communism. But my point in saying that is this. You could have a nation which is influenced by Christianity. You know, obviously, at least 80 percent of the founding fathers, if not more, were heavily influenced by Christianity. And, and that led to a lot of the way that they dealt with the, the founding documents of this nation in a good in a good way. So. It's, it's like, do I believe in absolute morality? Well, you made the point earlier in so many words that our standards and our understandings of right and wrong evolve as society evolves, obviously, as they should. So, and how's you know, it do we now, yeah, I mean, do we now treat people differently than we used to, regardless of how we feel about what they're doing? Yes. And I don't know anybody. I know some people that will say extreme things because they want to see yeah. extreme. Yeah. But I don't know anybody that really thinks we should throw homosexuals off of rooftops. 
I don't know anybody who really wants to live in a world where we do that. Even the, the few people that say it for shock value don't mean it. So I think that we have to admit. I don't know. I think yeah. Steve Anderson may really mean it. I think oh, Matt Powell might quick. disagree with you there. But let me finish the point real quick. The, just because I want to get it out while it's fresh in my mind. So my understanding of what God expects from the church is absolute. It is based upon scriptural authority. When I look in the mirror and I measure myself and I judge myself by the criteria of God's word, that is not changing. How I interact with the world, how I deal with society, how I handle situations, that is ever evolving. So I think that from a secular standpoint, of course, there's no such thing as absolute morality. And from a Christian standpoint, the only absolute is as it relates to the believers, the church, not as it relates to the world. So I think it's a bit silly. Christian nationalism is a bit silly. Uh, I understand the desire to do that, but I think it's a, a silly desire. I don't think that absolute morality exists. You know, if you look in the New Testament, for instance, there's many that? passages. I'm sorry, go ahead. Can I address that? Oh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, and, and I, I agree that the uh, uh, morality kind of evolves as we go along. I, I'm not sure. I think you might sort of be um a moral realist more than a moral absolutist because the whole idea of an absolute morality is that it is unchanging it's exactly the same one day to the next and when we talk about morality we're talking about how um what people ought to do in groups like so it's a social like it, it, it you know even though it might come from god it is applied in in a group like what humankind or what a nation or what a group ought to do so any interpretation of absolute morality that comes from the bible the the rules that govern what we ought to treat people back in the old testament should remain the same now m moral realism would say hey there's an objective morality maybe it comes from god's nature maybe it comes from something else that would say um you know that, that it's objective it's stance independent it's mind independent but it can change that's not a problem so i'm not sure if you you sort of you're applying absolute morality correctly i mean that's there. that's probably real similar honestly i've never heard that term like that before but that's probably real similar to how i see it i mean the what god says in relation to the new testament church is absolute he does not want, like, for instance, he does not want men to be feminine well, or women to be Do masculine. you mind if I just finish, yeah, Christian, because you brought up a whole oh, I'm sorry, I thought That's you were done, right. Mark. I'm sorry. Um, and, yeah, I, I absolutely agree that, that morals, uh, you know, evolve over time. I get that. Um, I do have a question about that. But when, when you're talking about, like, sort of your absolute, like, how you apply things, I think you're talking about your ethical actions rather than any sort of over overarching morality for society. Yes, that's right. So um, I... I I, no, I totally get that. That's fine. You know, absolute ethical standards. That's that's fine. Um, it's just where the morality comes from, which is the you know you have ethics that you apply to a moral system that overarches a population, but you've got to ask sort of well, where do those morals come from? Where where do they originate come from? And so I guess I'd pose to you, you know, something similar to the youth and fro dilemma, which is sort of where do the morals come from? Is it God's um, will that the morals happen in a certain way? Does he get them from another place? Uh, it, are they they sort of objective for the universe in general? Where do these moralities actually come from? Uh, yeah, do you mind if I answer that? Oh yeah, yeah. That's why I asked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Sorry, before you do though, Christian, I promised uh, Defender he could be next. He's oh, been waiting yeah. a really okay. long time. Well, I'll, I'll shelf Hi, that one, but it's, I'm really interested Hi, Aiden. in that, Christian. Sure. You guys can't get back to that. Well, Mark, he uh, he was messaging me frantically, saying that he he really needed some backup here. I I don't know why. I did a much better it. job at staying on script this time, Mark, compared to last time. So you're reading the script way better. I don't know why you need backup. I thought I you were here to back me up. Oh oh snap! Sorry, I, I thought it was, you were there to back uh, Christian up as well. I thought I thought. Yeah. You know. God knows yeah. I need it. I, That's I awfully didn't... strange. I thought I thought Christian was on our side. <laughs> Looks like we got a little Benedict I, Arnold situation I, 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 going on. I did need emotional oh, support, Aiden. I got to admit. Man, I, <laughs> I should I'm have not... suspected Christian when he didn't sign the book he sent me. Uh, but Defender, oh, you have the floor, sir. The pom poms are here, though, Mark. You are the moral support. Okay. So, Mark. Yeah. Evolution is a system of. of uh, 
we'll just say living organisms built on other living organisms and the ultimate goal is survival of the fittest. Oh. So if we're to believe that, Yeah, uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree anyway, with that definition. But go on, go on. Sorry. Anyway, more to the point. Um, w at what point should I expect like a lion to develop its own code of morals? And more, more even if it if it has to do with like say the development of the brain, when do we start seeing chimpanzees develop hey, Dustin, a moral code? And start Dustin, yeah. Um, Adam Lore out in the audience is saying that your audio is louder than everybody else's. Could yeah, you possibly yeah. try to go in and adjust it a little bit down? He was making a good better? point. Keep going, Dustin. I think that's better. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. So, um, more or less, like, when do we start seeing the chimpanzee feel guilty for? Um, you know, organizing his buddies to get together <laughs> and down the other chimpanzees down the way. No, they're, they're like, really when does questions. that start happening? Yeah, yeah, they're really good questions. Um, so evolution, I, I wouldn't hold I, up I, one second, Mark. Yeah. One second, Mark. Aiden, your microphone's doing that weird thing where it has the feedback again. Do you have I'm a different sorry. microphone, or I'm is sorry, it a setting? Man. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to set. I know. Sure I just I'm don't sorry. want to take away from what Mark is saying. Um, here, let, let me let me switch it out. Here real quick. Um, I actually have people with jackhammer drills over the road drilling away, but luckily my noise filter is incredible. <laughs> like it's incredible. I, I haven't heard that at all. Yeah, I yeah, no, I've got a now. I've got a really good noise filter. It uses like machine learning to filter noise. It's, it's absolutely incredible. I still hear it, Aiden. Uh, okay. Are you hearing it, Mark? You hearing it, guys? No, but I've got jackhammer drilling over the road, so you know I'm not going to hear hear it. Like I'm distracted by that. <laughs> okay. Well, Aiden, whenever you mute, I don't hear it anymore. So whenever you're ready to talk, just unmute and speak, and then mute afterwards. Sure. Uh, I I was just gonna. I I just want to say really quick, just because I haven't really had an opportunity to interject in this conversation yet. Um, just as uh, something in response to what you said, Dustin. Isn't and isn't the question of well when is the lion going to develop morality or is the chimp going to develop morality, isn't that kind of assuming the fact that morality is just something that creatures are inherently going to acquire as a process of evolution? Doesn't that just assume that that's just something that's built into things when that's not necessarily something that we observe? Like evolution isn't just if we're a process that, if, of things getting if, better. If we're using that as a focal point in order to make a true or false statement about the relation between morality and evolution, um, I think that the, the – how, how do I put this? Um, I think that it kind of le leaves w uh, kind of a little bit of space to say that since mankind develops its own kind of morality, that it kind of sets it apart in the evolutionary pattern. Um, I think that we're more developed than other animals. I think that our codes of morality are more developed, and it seems to be the more um, the more complex the brains of the, of the organism, the more it it shows a propensity for social interaction and working together. Um, so it, it's really interesting about, about chimpanzees because they do um, have... Uh, so I wouldn't go so far to say that any other animal has morality. I, I even did a debate about this. Do animals have morality? And I would say no. Um, however, some apes are showing what's called a proto-morality, something prior to developing morality where they have a, co a code of conduct. Um, the, the, the best example I have of this is the um, uh, capuchin monkeys, and they basically, um, they will gather food. And if one sees a snake, they'll let out an alarm call, like that'll warn the others and they'll scatter up the trees. Now, some of the capuchins who are lower on the social hierarchy that generally get bullied and their food taken, sometimes lie about there being a snake. So they'll make the call, the monkeys will scatter, and they'll sneak food, having lied about it. Now, if the other monkeys find this out, they will actually kick them out of the troop. 
right? Or punish them in some way, attack them and boot them out kind of thing, out of society. So I don't think it rises to the level of morality. I, I've got some, um, there's some very sort of highly specific philosophical reasons why I don't think it rises to that level, but it shows a proto-morality. It shows a general trend of what ought to be done in a social structure. Um, I think that the unique things about humans is that we're um, so good, you know, sort of with intelligence and, and pattern recognition that our we, we've developed this overarching code that we apply to our societies. And I think that's the difference. Um, I think that given enough time, um, it is it is completely possible that, that apes and other monkeys might actually get their own moral codes that are overarching over society. Just a, a, a curious question for yeah. you, Mark. Do you think any of the Ten Commandments are immoral? Um, do I think any of them are, are immoral? I think the first commandment is is probably immoral, like telling somebody what to believe. I don't I don't agree with. I don't think we ought to tell people that they have to believe something, especially under sort of pain of punishment. Um, I, I think that's wrong. Um, I think that it goes against most, you know, sort of modern constitutions from freedom of religion to say, you know, you're not allowed to worship anything else except this one God. Yeah. You're a bachelor, aren't you? I'm a what, sorry? A bachelor? Uh, no. Like single? No. You're no, married? I'm, I'm, I'm married. Yeah, I've been married for, for oh, a long time. You guys are like poly. No. I'm monogamous. Why? Oh. Would your wife come from? It's getting kind well, of it's, 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 it, it, it's not a, a trick question or a gotcha. It's just for our faith, it's a relationship and it's an even closer relationship and more intimate than one you would have with, say, like a wife. So when God says, have no other gods before me, it's the same as your wife saying, hey, be true to only me. Yes, but, um, but that's a Mark, five years everybody. ago, I broke that commandment. Well, see, the, the thing is... I that, broke that commandment five years ago Okay, by um, making I, I a just, person into an idol. I'd just like to respond that but that, but that's, you know, sort of saying, hey, you be faithful to your wife. And look, I, I, I totally think that that's, that's appropriate and that's a good thing to do. I, I, I totally think it is. Like a strong relationship requires, you know, tr built confidence and trust in the other person. So sure. Well, um, I mean, when you and your, well, let when me you finish, and your let significant other got married, though, they, she, well, uh, she or, finish. I assume she, I'm sorry, but she or he, they expected loyalty, she. right? And, and exclusivity. Uh, it's she um, that they expected exclusivity. Well, uh, I mean, that's something we decided together. It's not something that I, you know, she just demanded this and that's that's what happened. Um, well, that's what the covenant given to us from Moses was all about. Like he the, he gave us an option. Yeah, but it's done under duress, though, isn't it? Like that's right. Kind of that's the fundamental. That's difference. what I was trying to get to, that that basically it, it sort of says, um, you know, on a thou shall have no other gods before me kind of thing. So you don't have the option to choose if you want to be a Hindu or be a, a you know, worship Allah or worship a, you know, Zoroastrian god or, you know, you don't have that choice. Whereas in my marriage, I could choose another. It's not like my wife said to me, hey, you've got to marry me and you don't have a choice and you're not allowed out of this marriage. I, I could choose another, another uh, partner um tomorrow if i want i have that freedom not that i would um if if my wife is watching i, I have no intention to honey no well, i mean I, we no, had the I'm, same I'm very type happy, but yeah cover your bases well, cover we your had bases. the same we had we had the same no, type she's of freedom awesome. she's awesome we see in the text that israel strayed away and went after other gods and got punished for it so like they had that that option yeah. too i got smoke just like if yeah. you were to cheat on your wife she has the option to divorce you can yeah, she smite not him though me. like yeah, yeah. Can I interject for a second here? Sure, Grayson. Cool. Yeah, go ahead. I, I think that uh, fundamentally the, the difference is there's just no threat. If my wife, if my partner leaves me, nothing bad will happen to her. There might be some contention with our children or whatnot, but we are together because we want to be. First, I am certain of her existence. Our relationship started because we met each other, we talked to each other, we had common interest. where God just says, especially in the Ten Commandments, worship me. Or else, I mean, that's it, it, put it how you want, but that's really it. You either worship him or you suffer. 
Um, yeah, I, I, I think that... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I think that that's basically what I'm getting at, that, that when you have... Um, like, so if you're using my wife as an example, it's kind of, I, I, I met her and I had the, the choice of whether to be with her or not. Well, the, the first commandment kind of suggests that you don't, you don't have any choice. This is your God and you, you better worship him because, I mean, obviously it was applying to the people of Israel, you know, don't get me wrong, but, um, well, the, a whole idea of saying that you have to believe in this person and you cannot believe in any you can decide God. to disobey it sure I, you do I, have I, the ability to disobey and be just like you punished. can cheat on your wife i mean you have the ability to disobey the same way that a slave has the ability to disobey its master though but the difference between the relationship that's being described here though is is that an enslaved i mean it's even the term that's used by christians that they're a slave to christ that they're a slave to mm -hmm. god so when you're talking but about a really relationship late. Well, that's not a slave then. That's not a true slave. A slave does not willingly shackle themselves into enslavement at that point because they're well, not. Maybe a they slave. shouldn't say that. I don't know. Well, that's I what the Bible says. I consider a child right? of God. I'm one of his children. That well, it, it also describes you as a slave, though, and that's why I said yeah. that I did only purely just because I, it is a very good illustrative point of the fact that it is a relationship which is done under not only just the threat of death. But worse than death, the threat mm. of not only death, but also eternal damnation and torment yeah. beyond any sort of imagination. So there's there's that. But I also wanted to kind of, and we can circle back to this if you want, but I kind of wanted to go to what Dustin was talking about earlier just to ask him real quick um, and have a follow-up. Do, do you think that empathy ties in with morality? Like, do you think there's a fundamental interplay between empathy and morality, Dustin? No. You can be empathetic to somebody and be completely immoral in the same time. So, so By the way, Krishna says he might come back. Well, you, oh, you can, I'd, I'd you love can to talk have, to Krishna again, actually. You could feel empathy within your mind and not do that, but I'm more talking about the demonstration of empathy more than just the feeling of it, than just the emotion of it within your mind. Well, I, I guess, I guess, I, to clarify, I think he's asking like, does empathy influence morality? Does does empathy influence how you think you ought to behave towards people? So, well, hold on a second here. I don't yeah. think empathy and morality are even on the same. No, no, you have empathy, right? And then you have morality. To empathize with someone is to understand their position mm -hmm. to have morality is to offer them a way out or at least help in some way. Well, no, morality is the code of conduct that societies, um, well, I mean, it's used descriptively and it's used prescriptively, right? So there's the descriptive one, which is how a society behaves towards one another. And there's prescriptive, there's sort of the morality that we're talking about is how you ought to behave in a society, what you ought to do um, in your group kind of thing, that's morality. So I guess what, what Aiden's probably getting at is that when I, um, I can use empathy to say, hey, would I like, you know, somebody telling me that I had to worship a certain God, right? And if I say, no, I wouldn't like that, then my, my empathy, like my ability to understand somebody else is what is guiding what ought to be done. Does that make sense? Do, do you employ that at all? The, the empathy me, to say, hey, would I like this? Analogy. Let me try and make an analogy here, okay? Sure. So I can empathize with someone I see get rear-ended on the street. It's the moral thing to do to grab my phone and take pictures of the guy as they're driving away and get their license plate. Right. There's a very clear line the two things yes right you don't have you it's not moral to take pictures of the guy who's getting out of the car with his insurance in hand right it, that's that's not moral right it's, if he's trying to do the right thing you're over here captain i've got my phone out that you know you, you, you see what i'm saying it's really there's interesting definitely that you make that distinction it's really interesting that you make that distinction because i was actually going a different way with things than mark was uh, oh, okay expecting Sorry. although it was it was a good it was a good train of thought to go down but what i was going to get at was the fact that 
it's actually not just humans that you can observe w exactly what you're talking about and prescribing to morality then you can also observe that within rats because we've seen in studies that if you trap a rat and there isn't even an option for that other rat that's trying to free that rat to so you have two rats and you have one that's trapped the other rat that is trapped it doesn't even have an option of reuniting with the other rat that's trying to free it but not only do we observe that that rat, without any reward of meeting that rat, will in fact try to free its fellow rat, but in situations where it can eventually meet up with the other rat and it has a supply of food, it will save some of that food supply for the other rat, even though it has no direct incentive to be able to do that whatsoever. So it's interesting that you say that the difference between morality and empathy is the actual action of doing something because that's exactly what we're observing there. It's not even a matter of the rat thinking in its head, man, I really should free this rat. It's actively pursuing a means of trying to make sure that this other rat situation is benefited with no direct benefit to itself. So that would be, at least as far as what my understanding of how you're describing morality, that would be morality. It is making a moral decision at that point to free that other rat because it does not benefit in any way, shape or form itself. So do you think maybe at any one point did that the lion maybe thinks to himself while he's like slashing into the lamb, this is maybe a bad idea? That's what Grayson believes. Well, hang on a second. But that I do not how believe does that, that. How does that answer what I said? Though? Hang on. How hang does on. that answer I, what I said? Well, can I just address that for a second? Because I back, but I do agree with you, Aiden. So, so morality is over populations, right? So if we're looking at morality for humans, it's over human populations, which is why the morality of the United States maybe differs than the morality of Japan, and they may differ on certain things. A lot of things are the same because we're all human, but there are certain things that they would differ highly on as far as morality is concerned. Um, so when you're talking about lions, you really have to apply, I mean, I don't even think that animals have like a true morality, but if you're talking sort of a proto-animalistic sort of empathy morality system, you would apply it to that population because even humans kill one another outside of their population, right? It's very unusual for humans to kill each other in the population, but outside of their group, that's when the, the, the horrible stuff starts to happen. Well, so, can I ask you a question, Mark? Yeah. Okay, so can you describe what niche in the environment would have needed to have been filled in order for humanoids or whatever you believe our far back ancestors are yeah. to develop morality? Yeah, social. To evolve morality? Yeah, yes. sociality. Sociality. Social, social interaction, yeah. It's as simple as that. So there's two base um, emotions that lead to morality as far as we can see. One Aiden covered already, it's empathy, being able to um, see yourself in that person. Like, So the perfect example is Defender of the Gospel. Um, when you see somebody come out of their car and they've got their insurance in hand, I would feel terrible if I had my insurance in hand and someone took pictures of me like a criminal. Yes, that would make me feel terrible. I can empathize that that person would feel terrible if I did the same thing. That's empathy. The other one, and, and so the one that's underlooked is reciprocity. And that is getting the same reward for the same task or same thing that you do. Um, so again, yeah. capuchin monkeys, they've done studies with them that, um, you know, if, if they do the same work and they get unequal rewards, the, one of the monkeys will get really upset. It's the idea that things should be fair, right? And so these two things working in tandem give rise to sociality and a social interaction structure that um, allows us to work with one another, that we can say, hey, for a start, I won't treat you badly because I would be, feel bad to be treated that way. And number two is, well, if you get something for doing a certain task or a certain thing, I should get the same thing. Things should be fair in society. So I'm going to interject for a second because I, I think that I agree that I think empathy and reciprocity are the two things that guide society towards uh, moral outcomes. Um, but with that being said, I think you all know that I am incapable of feeling empathy. It's just not with the capacity that I have, yet I still have a moral code. So I don't think it is necessary, but I guess I do have a sense of fairness because that's not an emotion. Right, right. Uh, it, uh, uh, hmm. Socio or, or, or psycho? Antisocial personality disorder. Okay, gotcha. Yep. 
That's cool. Um, All good. Look, um, it, empathy, go ahead. Uh, it, it, so empathy is probably what led to the development of moral codes, but um, you can get morality from total, um, so altruism from complete selfishness, right, is, is sort of how it's described. Symbiotic. Um, Symbiotic relations re led to morals. I would interject that. It was the idea that you and I can both profit off um, of working together. It's a symbiotic relationship. Are all relation are all human relationships inherently symbiotic? Yeah, I don't I mean, think like, that's the case. Oh no, no, some of them are combative, and then some of them are 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 dependent, and some of them are codependent. It just depends. Well, so when... I I think that to say that yeah. it inherently came from that, I don't think is necessary. I think that that's a bit of a simplification, simply because it's not what we observe within our own socio hierarchical systems that seem to go back as far as we can observe within our own history because can i ask you guys a question I, has I, has I, evolution yeah. stopped no why would it under what no. mechanism would it okay so my next question would be what is the next animal to develop the capability to like say misuse hashtags how could we know that uh, probably a dolphin it gets hands I mean, what would just be your best guess? What's the um, most evolved species next to us, in your opinion? If they were, if they probably were capable, ch I, chimpanzees or oh, bonobos. Sorry. My money would probably be on the bonobos because they are sort of yeah. more uh, less aggressive and more socially adept, if you will. Um, there's also a case to be made for octopus and other cephalopods, um, but I don't think it's that strong because they're still, you know, in water makes it difficult. So, but I don't know. See, the the, the whole. The only the whole thing about what happens next in evolution is all based on environment. It's all based on what happens around us kind of thing. So it, it's kind of impossible to know without knowing the environments that we're going to be in or what happens to the earth. And, and I don't think anybody knows that. I agree. And it would be in such a long time scale that it'd be purely speculative. And oh, then with, with humans, we would be putting counter pressure in anything to develop that ability. I mean, we would just... I, I don't, I don't see how other creatures could possibly develop emergent, uh, yeah, emergent intelligence to our level with us being here. I think we would destroy that. No planet of the apes, Grayson. I think, no. I think the biggest thing that holds back the biggest, at least in my mind, the biggest contender, and call a cliche if you want, but I, I, I think that the dolphin is a, an absolute fantastic contender as Flipper. far as the complexity yeah. of their social relationships and interactions that they have with one another. The fact that they use unique names amongst one another and have unique reciprocations amongst each other in a way that we really don't observe within any other animal, a unique... Not totally, but a very unique, comparatively, ability to recognize its own reflection compared to other animals as well makes it a very good contender of something that I would imagine very well could eventually develop some sort of sense of uh, self-awareness in the colloquial term, I, I think. I think there's actually a decent chance it could already have a primitive sense of that right now. Oh, sure. It's just a lack of manipulation that's the problem for dolphins that's yeah that's their the physiology big, yeah this sheer physiology is the problem for them but isn't there a distinction between self-awareness and a sense of self oh absolutely yeah. that's what that's what i'm i think that was what i was trying to allude to but you just more eloquently put it into into practice thank god i have you guys to do that for me i'm i gotta i gotta have my backup i was saying that i was the backup in reality you guys are the ones dragging me along here I'm well the sure. joke is on you gentlemen we're also using you to sharpen our skills <laughs> oh no they've been used, we've we've been had all along yeah no that's good i, I don't think any discussion is is worthless or, or you know m m actually no I, I tell a lie there's certainly some that i've been in that have been absolutely worthless but that's, <laughs> I, I still think it's far <laughs> between. there's always something hopefully <laughs> hopefully that wasn't on this channel mm, not at all no no there's there's a few there's a few real um interesting people out there um people that you know i'm thinking of one in particular who claims to have a physical relationship with god it's kind of it's a wacky one you, you don't even want to know it's it's crazy I know it gets heated over at Standing for Truth whenever you guys are on that open mic with Ken and everybody. I was just it annoyed. It can get pretty heated. I was just annoyed that I waited so long. I didn't even get to ask Kent one question. And and um, 
Lucky, I was just going to repeat a question that had been asked earlier that he didn't answer. So I, I, I was kind of annoyed, but that's okay. I mean, I, yeah, uh, I, I think, I think Kent was a bit mean to, to AJ, um, but you know, it, it's Kent. Well, he's, he's AJ is kind of a tacky. If you watch his videos, they get a little I bit mean, personal towards Kent. I mean, sure. I, I, I'm not, a, I'm not a Kent fan, and I think that gets a little bit personal from AJ. Yeah, I, I'm not sure where that's coming from. It's kind of like I, I think that. Um, you know, I, I think that the perspective, I, I know that, that AJ has sort of, um, um, he helped out Cindy when, when that went down kind of thing. So um, he he has seen some of the, the devastation there. So I, I'm sure he's, you know, not happy about that. So, um, yeah, it's, it, you know, I, I'll probably leave it at that. I, I, I think that I might, you know, stop commenting Mr. on that. Did you ever get to ask your question? I've been training a younger creationist chatbot on Kent Hoban debate. Oh, so if you want to ask your question? Yeah, I've been training yeah, one. Sure. Very good. Well, the the whole thing was that he said that that sort of the birds were at the top because they could fly. And the question, the brilliant question, I, I wish I could remember who asked it. Somebody asked it, and he didn't answer it. It was if if flying animals are at the top, why aren't pterodactyls, tranodons, uh, quetzalcoatls, the the flying dinosaurs at the top as well? Why are they so far down? The fossil layers. Because of all that magnetic ice. It's because of all that magnetic ice. Are you talking ice? about in the geologic, the or geological column? Yeah, yeah. Or like an evolutionary scale. Somebody well, send an invite to Brett Keen. Okay. I why why I, would we? I, okay, sure. Okay. You <laughs> want to see a fist fight on the screen? He's gonna he's gonna add a lot to this conversation. I don't think he'll accept the offer. Uh, Steven, I've actually got Talk a question for you though. I asked a question to Dustin. I have a question for you, Mister Proverbs guy. Oh mercy. Um, so I, I was just wondering in terms of going back to the morality thing, um, would you consider if you make an alliance with somebody like the, the maintenance of that sort of alliance with that person, would you consider that a moral thing? Would you consider it a matter of morality that you maintain that alliance with that person? Or do you think that it's just pure pragmatism? That it's only just to our, our physical benefit that I stay allies with this person? Or do you think that there is, in fact, a moral component to that? I'm glad you didn't ask me that question, Aiden. Um, okay, so I would say in, a, in most situations, yes. Like, if two countries are going in it, putting it all in, lives, fortune, everything is at stake. And they depend on each other greatly as allies. And then one backs out over the other. Yes, I would say they violated some law of morality. Okay, it's it's interesting you say that because ants, of course, because you as... only bring gotchas. I, so I what's, don't, what's 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 the it's axe? Not, it's it's not just gotcha. Hey, that's not fair. That's not fair. I you can, you have the perfect ability to respond to this however you'd like. But the reason I brought it up was because if you look at ant colonies and you look at the interconnected systems of alliances that they have amongst one another, it mm -hmm. isn't just a matter of pure pragmatism with those colonies. What we observe, there is situations that we observe where one colony is seriously on the back burner, is seriously getting overwhelmed by another group. And the original alliance with that colony doesn't just abandon it and turn tail because that's what's immediately beneficial for them to do. They stick by that colony and they try their best to make sure that the ground that's lost by it is, is maintained and upheld. So would you say in that particular scenario, even though it's not more physically beneficial for those colonies to remain allies... Would you say that there's some manner of morality being demonstrated amongst those two different colonies that are still allies in spite of the pragmatic need to uh, not be allies in that particular scenario? So I feel like you could have really boiled that question down to do something as small as the an ant my, display the morality. My question isn't important. Could, could isn't it important. could it have been boiled down to that? <laughs> I mean, sure, but I'm I'm not I've never been known as a pervacious speaker. All right, I'm sorry. Brevity may be the soul of wit, but I've never claimed to have much of that. So, the length of the length of the question that I had though isn't necessarily important. The substance of it was. Okay, but just to clarify, I was correct in my shortening of your question. I'm sorry. Could you? Does the ant have short? morality? Um. Does the ant have morality with the demonstration of the behavior I just uh, gave an example of? I'm going to level with you, Aiden. 
Your example was so long, I don't even remember what it was. Can you okay. tell me again? Sure. Um, let me give you a TLDR, okay? So, imagine there's three different ant colonies, okay? Ant colony A, ant colony B, and ant colony C. There's okay. ant colony C is getting overwhelmed by ant colony B. Mm-hmm. Ant colony B and ant colony A are allies. Mm-hmm. Even though it would benefit ant colony A to just abandon ant colony B, leave it behind, just either either leave it behind or also take advantage of the nutrients that are available in colony C's nests, it chooses not to do that and chooses to, or sorry, colony B, and re- chooses to remain on the side of colony B in spite of the actual advantage on just a pure physical level, or sorry, a pure um, pragmatic level. Why does it demonstrate that behavior if not morality as far as what you just described? Okay, sure. I could consider that a form of morality. Okay. So morality isn't something that is just unique to humans then? Uh... I don't know. I you just said that if it if if it is a form of morality, then is that does that not follow? Well, I said it's a form of morality. I sure. don't know if it completely constitutes morality. So it's it's a fundamental component. I think of I morality I think I was clear as... though that there was a distinction for me. Um, not necessarily. You said it was a form of morality, but a form of morality is still morality, is it not? A rose by any other, uh, by any other smell is still the same thing. Come back, name. come, Sorry. come back to me on that in like 10 minutes and I, I'm going to be pondering on it because I've never contemplated that. While you're pondering sure. it, I'll give you a similar example. Uh, elephants, when they're young die, they will often carry around the dead elephant in their trunk for days. And, it, and just uh, you could start to find grief onto it, but it seems to be that's what they're doing. What do you think of that uh, behavior with the an animals? Oh, I definitely think that there's something conscious about them. Even dogs. Dogs are so loyal. They'll they'll love you even if you're a bad master. Yeah, that is tr- it is truly unconditional. I just had to put my dog down after like 15 years. But that's not that, – don't so, get on oh, no, That's okay. She was old. She was like 19 years old. I'm saying that to say this part. I got her when she was four, and yeah. apparently someone must have abused her in the past because for 15 years she was afraid of men, including me. So if I like – I never touched her, never did anything negative to that dog. But even if I so much as quickly walked towards her, she would whimper down and roll on her stomach and cry. And it's like – it's just so sad. that Yeah, it's, yeah. I, I don't know why I would tell that story. It's, it's just – They just learn behavior, and she couldn't unlearn that because, like children, puppies learn these things. Yeah. I'm sorry, dude. Yeah, I'm sorry. That happens. You gotta go. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is really tragic. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that, man. I hope that, um, I hope that you've been able to do all right in spite of all of that. I know it can be really devastating the loss of a of an important pet. So. Well, this is one of the benefits of not not feeling emotions. It does not affect me in the way it would affect you guys, but I I do miss my dog. Oh, but uh, I am not sad about it because I cannot be. <laughs> I'm still sorry to hear about that nonetheless. Hey, just Thank because you, you can't you. use empathy doesn't mean I can't use it on you, yeah. Grayson. It's just it's just me oh, trying snap. to be a good person. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just no, kidding. no, I, I get what you're saying. That I would feel sad if that happened to me. So I can I can I can empathize with that. Absolutely. Um, I know. I, can I, my partner took it really I, bad. But I, you just gotta do what you do. I yeah, would okay. actually like for you, Aiden, to ask that same question to Stump. Um, sure. If, if I, I would, I would like it. to be able to feed off what he thinks. You're, you're, so you're phoning a friend is the option that you're choosing with. If I can. Oh, come on. Yeah. Now. Okay. Like, yeah. I, think it's, I, think it's <laughs> I mean, I did phone. allow, I did allow <laughs> three atheists on at one time. I think we're actually, no, we're not equal numbers. We're one off. So we have a slight advantage, but I think you guys have higher IQs. So we're probably still at a disadvantage. I mean, oh, well, first I of all, that. I don't agree with the I don't agree with the higher IQ thing. But second of all, I take on three Christians at a time all the time around here. That's nothing. It's nothing for oh, me, Providence guy. Come on now. Look, Aiden. At the end of the day, when we're traveling to the Middle East, we're both Canadian. All right, that's all that matters, bro. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, you know what? We'll we'll see about that, eh? We'll see about that. <laughs> well, don't mess, don't, don't mess with me, Hosea. 
I forget what, what you're trying to say over there, there hoser? I said, oh, call me a hoser hose head, eh? Hey, that's right, eh? Why don't you go watch some Trailer Park Boys and be quiet with that, eh? Why don't no, we but... go get some Canadian bacon and have some brew, eh? I mean, it goes really good with poutine, dude. It's it's, it's no lie. So uh, What I, is poutine? I, I, I wouldn't mind What trying... is poutine? I'm sorry, Mark. We he's got him just, professional. He's just rising. I want to throw back to the Ten Commandments. I, I want to know, is, is violating the Ten Commandments always immoral? Like, so just, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie is the ones I usually... Have a yes, it's immoral, okay. but not just not just the thou shalt not murder, but it goes to the extreme. Like if I hate my brother, I've murdered in my heart. I already violated it. So, so from that, the get go, I'm, I'm immoral crime. with it. It is a crime. No, isn't that? It's sort a crime, crime that it. A what? Sort crime. Yes. I, I, explain. Well, what, usually when we're applying morality and say something is immoral, we're talking about actions, like what we ought to do, the action we ought to take. Like, so thinking, oh man, I hate my boss, I wish he was dead, is not a, a, a crime, usually is not a violation of morality. It's when you act upon it that it's the violation. But um, you're sort of suggesting that even if you think it, that that's, that's, you've, been, you've acted immorally. Yes. That is what scripture says, to be fair. That is a biblical view. I, of I knew it said that about thought. adultery, but I, I didn't know it was the same mm -hmm. for everything. Um, which is kind of weird because people do think, you know, stuff without acting on it all the time. I'm, I'm not sure if that's all the time. psychologically healthy um, to that's sort of everything. say I've violated morality just because I've said, oh man, I could, I could swipe that or something and then go, no, that's the wrong thing to do. Um, it sort of suggests that you can't make um, you, you in order to to decide whether something is moral moral or not. How do you evaluate things without being able to think of the consequences of them? That doesn't include anything. The scripture only speaks about uh, hating your brother and Had committing adultery. adultery in your heart with a woman lusting after her. Well, these commandments are for Christians, believers, but not for the general people. Okay. Um, so uh, let, uh, I'm not sure how that yeah, works. Jesus um, verified a lot of what was said in the Old Testament. But even even if it was by those specific standards, though, you would still have the exact same problem with the, those two topics, though, the hatred of your brother and uh, adultery, because just as Mark just said, how can you seriously contemplate the wrongness of those things if you're not allowed to think about those things at all whatsoever? Well, these things were said by Jesus, and he's trying to conform us conform us to him to who he is his image mm -hmm. and scripture clearly says that and these things are how we should be and we know we're in a fallen world we're carnal sure right but, now, Jesus, but he's, he's, oh, he's Jesus. trying to tell us he's trying to tell us how to conform to the, his image and be back where we should be with god sure but also though aiden you're connecting lust with the thought and i don't know if that's necessarily fair because you we can have a thought and we can rebuke the thought and it doesn't lead to lust well, okay. it, it Everyone says say hi to that even it does say that you have it within your heart, though, even if you just look upon that woman according to the scriptures. So. If you look upon that woman with lust, <laughs> but yeah, you're sort of saying context. if if you think about um, lying, for instance, if you think about bearing false witness, like should I call in sick today? You, you've basically committed an immoral action, even though you might say to yourself, should I call in sick today? I might call in sick today, but then go, no, I, I have an obligation and a, a sort of, you know, I, I need to be a good person. I need to go into work because that's what I've agreed to do. Um, I well, would see I, that I, as I, completely moral. I, I think it might be a difference of perception because, see, it's not like, oh, man, I just thought about stealing. I'm such a bad, nasty, terrible person. It's more like, right. okay, what's wrong with my heart that I just thought about stealing? Jesus, what's going on with me inside? I'm sorry that I even thought about violating your laws like that. You know, what's going on in my heart? It's it's something to reflect on, self-examination. Well, sure. I mean, you can you can always do that. I just wouldn't, wouldn't rise that to the level of m morality as such. I, I think that morality would be actions rather than um, any consideration 
of actions ought to be taken or, or you know possible actions that ought to be played out i mean you could even now an analyze hey if i grab that i could you know watch this tonight or you know have this benefit in my life but then outweighed by the the consequences of your actions on the the person that owns it the, the business that's running it the the uh, uh the the consequence to society of people running around and stealing things um i, I don't see one of those uh, you know I wouldn't see that as immoral as such. I would just see that as a consideration of consequence. So, you're very I'll choppy right now, hey, Dustin. Hey, yeah. Dustin, I really do want you to chime in, but you are very choppy, bro. But um, it's, so you said that sort of stealing is is always immoral, and and lying is always immoral, kind of thing that they're they're set in stone. So. What about those instances where, like, there is your family starving or something and you need to steal bread? Or, um, you know, someone, some, a criminal comes to their, your door and you're, you're hiding your family and, and if you, you bring your family, they're going to kill them kind of thing. Is, is lying still immoral in that case? What was that play where a guy is being chased by a policeman for stealing a loaf of bread. Uh, lo La Miserable. La, La Miserable. Yeah. You reminded me of La Re uh, Mark. You reminded me of La Miserable. Yeah, and that was, um, that was you know, that was during the French Revolution, and it was, uh, yeah, really, really mm -hmm. tough time I, I, for the people, sure. I would imagine yeah. that, uh, I would imagine, though, that in that instance, and the Christians in this room can correct me if I'm wrong, but in that instance, you have the back door, so to speak, of asking Christ for forgiveness and asking him to forgive you of that sin in that instance of you doing that. But even then, it's still a subtle admission that that is something that was right. wrong for you to do. And well, there's no there's no question that it, it's immoral. The, the Bible says thou shalt not steal, so there's no gray area left in there. However, how God is going to judge you based off your motives, I don't have a certain answer. Well, I, I can I, just I, tell you that from our faith, he's just. Yeah, I, I've I mean, always, I've always, um, I've always had a problem with Immanuel Kant because that's basically virtue ethics, right? That it's always immoral to lie, for instance. And then you have the example of, you know, living living in in Germany and the Nazi, like the Gestapo comes to your door and says, you know, um, um, bring forth those those Jews or else we'll we'll, you know, and and you know that if they bring you bring forth the Jews, they'll shoot all of you, kind of thing. Well, so, I, to be fair, Mark, you didn't yeah. ask me if I believed good could come from telling a lie. Well, wait, because wait, George wait. Washington told a lot of lies to help win the Revolutionary War. So good can come from telling a lie. But that doesn't change the fact in our faith that lying, period, is still a sin. Stealing, period, is a sin. Well, we're, we're talking about oughts, right? So morals is what you ought to do in society. Alts? Oughts, yeah. Oh, like, what so, you ought to do. Right, so what you well, ought to what's, do in well, society. If, if you don't mind, what would yeah. be the line between morality and what you just ought to do? That That is morality. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. so you're not drawing a difference. No. I thought you were just dividing them. No, 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 no. Morality okay. is, is the, the code of conduct which you ought okay. to adhere to, right? So when whenever we're looking at a decision, right, so... I mean, morality is incredibly complex. That's why I love talking about it. And it is, like, don't get me wrong, Stephen, it is one of the most complex things we're, we're ever going to discuss because we're really talking about actions applied to our society, which is insanely complicated to start with. But Yeah, um, and I'm sorry I'm not a more worthy opponent. No, 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 no. No, it's, it's fine. It's, it's, you're not an opponent. We're should just be. sort of throwing back back and forth ideas. Um that, that when, when we look at sort of what actions we, we are taking, you know, there sh or we, well, should we ought to do one thing or should we ought to do another? Like, what is the correct one to do? Um, and why is it the correct one to do? Where are we getting that? Where does that morality come from? Um, that's, that's the big question. So morality is about what we ought to do. And if the, if the goal at the end provides good, then I would say that you have a reason to ought to do that, right? So regardless of what, um, whether it's, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by a sin, um, because I don't really use that terminology. Um, I simply use well, a, uh, 
just to give you an understanding of how we use sin, sin is transgression of God's law. Okay. One of those laws being um, not to lie. But that would make you guys, if I may, real quick. All right. I'm going to have to bow out. Okay. Oh, sorry, Ryan. Yeah, yeah. Good to meet. Good to see All you right. again. Got, good good Ryan. Ryan. got a cute dog, hey, man. Give, give that dog yeah, a pet for it. me, Everything please. Give very him a pat on the head. And, uh, had a very nice, good conversation. Um, y'all take care. Y'all have a good, good night. night Ryan. I would say good night, except Mark. Good day. Yeah, yeah. I just that. Thanks, Ryan. Good to see you, mate. Mark. All right. Don't you think thoughts are outcome dependent? I mean, don't yeah, you think you yeah. do things, you ought to do things based on the outcome you want? Welcome back, Christian Pike. And Mark, I just want to say I still miss Steve Irwin. You still missed what, sorry? Steve Irwin, Crocodile Hunter. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I've got mixed feelings. It, it was going to it was gonna happen eventually, the way that he interacted with animals. Um, but everybody thought it was going to be a croc or a deadly oh, snake. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, animals are dangerous, all of them. You know, they, they have defense mechanisms and so do the stingray. So, you know, he got, he got complacent around dangerous animals and there's sort of only one way that's going to end. So... Um, but you know he was a lovely guy he was a lovely guy but um unwise definitely unwise so you know do you guys even realize or acknowledge that like here in the united states he's one of our local heroes yeah yeah i know it means a lot to the united <laughs> states i get that it's just you know he, he he was a nice guy in australia he was just a nice guy you know? like he was just yeah his nice wife guy. his wife was really stand out as well like she she yeah. completely stayed loyal to him after his death and never yeah took advantage of his name or sold mm -hmm. out or anything like that, which is actually shockingly common. Well, given they, they were into animal position. conservation, which was really noble and, and really nice thing to do kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that he was sort of American national treasure. I don't think he was sort of, but he was still highly regarded in, in Australia. Don't get me wrong. It's just a lot of people said to him, you are taking too many risks with animals. Like you are being dangerous. And I, yeah. I think it's kind of unfair on his family the amount of risk that he took without safety precautions. Um, I totally agree with that. Yeah, but, you know, a lovely guy at the end of the day. It's, it's, a, it's a tragedy. Uh, his family, you know, made the most of it and, and, and you know, consolations to them. And they did, they're doing work with, with sort of, um, you know, um, uh, animal conservation. They run Australia Zoo. So, you know, good luck to them and, and all the best. But, um, yeah, I, I, my only problem is that he was told again and again and again it's really dangerous. So, yeah, it is what it is. True. What's uh, what's going on, Aiden? And also, hi, Christian. Christian, welcome Christian. back. Welcome back to the room. Hey, I'm um, back. Sorry, I'm balancing a strawberry frosty, a hamburger, and driving in my pajamas. Christian okay. can never. Christian can never just be like sitting in his couch. That's, that's one thing I've learned good. about Christian. That's good. Sitting on my couch. I know. No, I. Point. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that like it's a bad thing in the yeah. slightest. Like this guy's like the equivalent of like a Mongolian nomad. Every single <laughs> second that I'm talking to him, he's like he's like bounding across the steps in his saddle with his yak meat underneath, so that it can Firing cure underneath the saddle and his horse. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> I will say seriously. It. It's ridiculous. Uh, but I, I, I was going to say was, is that, um, Stephen, uh, one thing I found interesting, it was a conversation that you guys were having earlier before I was able to join. Um, it was related to, um, documentation of somebody and the validity of their existence and the things that they did related to Jesus. And, uh, one of the people that you brought up was Julius Caesar. And I, 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 I love Roman history myself, so I thought that it'd be interesting to get into that because Caesar is a great example of a phenomenon that you see with anybody in history. And it's that even within a century or two, uh, a figure as monumental as Titanic as Julius Caesar was on the Roman state is somebody who is going to amass so many myths about himself and is going to establish such a huge mythos just around his very character to the point where Octavian, better known as Augustus, is his successor, actively rallied and campaigned for him to be declared a god. I mean, even mm -hmm. during his lifetime, he tried to postulate that he was a god. Yes. He would wear the, he would wear his triumphal regalia in public, and he would have himself uh, ridden around in his triumphal chariot and associated with uh, the god Apollo. So, 
these sorts of things that came to be mythologized about Caesar, even just within a few centuries, let alone in comparison to places like the Eastern Roman Empire. Hey, there's Aiden? Just, there's, there's a, oh, I'm just about done. I'm just about done. Okay. There's a big mythos that's built up around Caesar is what I'm trying to say, and I just, I'm, I'm a little confused why you think that somehow that has just escaped Jesus in the fact that there, there is bound to be with somebody as important as Jesus is, because I don't deny his existence, but there is bound to be several layers of mythology that have been compounded upon him and wrapped up around him, even within the time directly after his lifetime. Full disclosure, I'm going to let Christian answer that. And the reason being is I have not eaten supper and I'm going to go make a sandwich and I'll be gone for about three minutes. Come and on. I trust <coughs> Christian to be able to support the doctrine. I'll answer your question I'm when joking. I get back. I'm, I'm still too. trying to ponder on the morality of ants. So I <laughs> I, I, sorry, I'm still right lost on that. But before I go uh, for a couple seconds, I want to point out Mark or really Aiden or Grayson, do you guys feel like we're trying to hint you? Trying to what? Trying to what? Well, Terrence out in the comments, he says, Mark Reed is the big boss and everybody else is like henchmen. Uh, Do you feel well, like that, you're trying to lynch you or something? I don't, I don't he's, feel like he's, a, a big boss. I, I don't, me. I don't even Mark know. Mark is a more experienced him. debater than probably the rest of us, but other than that, I don't think. He's also a slightly more popular YouTuber, which would lend uh, us listening to him speak more, but none of these things are give him, uh, I guess, superiority right. like the rest of us, just a... Uh, uh, we want to listen to him because he is more popular in a social setting than the rest of us. Uh, right, right. Well, I mean, are you that's serious, a perfect, Grayson? That's a perfect. Like a big boy. No, it's perfect because um, Marcus Aurelius, who was one of the great Stoics, um, called philosophy the great equalizer. Right. So he had his best friend was a slave who was also a Stoic, who he learnt a lot of, and that gave him respect for people's um, people's arguments rather than who they are. My arguments stand on their own merits, as do Grayson's, as do Aiden's, as do everybody's. Like, it, it, if, if you're listening to me because I've got, like, more followers on YouTube, then what are you doing? Like, seriously, you, you should you should you should follow the arguments, not not people Like don't. And I, yeah, I, w I went and I went and I bought the ski mask and the tire iron oh, and the get up and everything. And you're telling me that I can't be your henchman now. Are you serious? Yeah, I don't. Okay, I do Look, I can't afford iron. to pay you, sir. I don't. I, I can't believe this. I can't. You, you, sir, you're a professor. Are you not? Like you're, you're making a bet. You're making a good amount of money. We can negotiate this after the show. We can negotiate this after the show. That's what I'm okay. To say. Anyway, um, <laughs> short negotiation. I sure. just. <laughs> oh, that's that's. Don't don't do me like that, Mark. I think ah, I'm supposed yeah. to be defending the doctrine around here or something. Um, you were supposed to you were supposed to be responding to what I just said about how it's there's a propensity in human history for extremely important figures to be mythologized even within the period during and after their lifetime, and how it's kind of strange in my opinion how you Christians don't really apply that whatsoever to Jesus. Okay, I have a twofold response. Uh, part one is that there's no response needed. That's obviously just generally true, but part two is you think you know more about Julius Caesar than I do, son? Because I will debate you on Julius Caesar. I can debate Julius Caesar all day long. You know I what, dude? I will debate you in a formal setting. You're Labinus. You're Labinus to my Caesar. I'm sorry. You want to be as good as me, but you you're not quite there. You think you know some things about You're not quite there. You think you know some things about Caesar? Did you know you just that the behavior... back to North Africa. Did you know that the behaviors of Aurochs are only known because Caesar documented them? It did yes did you know sir did you really that <laughs> yes um did you know sir that julius caesar is the one that is responsible for caesar salad no I'm just <laughs> oh, wow that that makes did you cry. know that know. he only left the british isles because druids set themselves on fire and it freaked him out well, that's part of the reason, but that's actually not the main reason why he ended up leaving. That was the first beach assault that he ended up doing on the Britannic Isle. That's true. Steven, set the debate but up, Steven. the reason why he ultimately left was because of a massive storm wrecking his ships that made him 
want to get out of there as soon as but now maybe did he view that as a bad omen the fact that they indirectly participated yeah, in the giant druid sacrifice they were sacrifice. on fire aiden no they only lit themselves on fire after the main course of the battle they didn't do that right away they like had a huge fight prophecy, they, had, right? they had a huge fight and then they were like oh wow it's really weird how they all threw themselves naked and unarmed at us and then they're like oh crap there's a huge sacrificial pyre right here we just inadvertently <laughs> participated in a giant human sacrifice mark tell this man about caesar I, I don't know that much about Caesar, to be honest with you. I, I, Take care of my yeah. light work, Mark. I'm back. Okay, I have my sandwich. Set up the debate. Set it up. Set it up. Who's debating who? So in, in what you sense do you Christian? think oughts aren't outcome dependent? Because to me, it seems like anything you ought to do, uh, you ought to do it because you want a certain outcome. Huh. That's very interesting. You got a response to that christian or is that... yeah like a little i do so what's your response christian caesar ought to invade the land of gaul and use the tribes against each other kind of like we did with the native americans did you nonsense. know that Aiden? it's nonsense hold on you you say that they should invade the tribes of gaul but you know what let me just ask you for a second what have the tribes of gaul done to you lately all right Not what have much. they done what have they done oh, oh yeah they sacked the city of rome like 400 years ago what does that matter come on let's just get over it let's just learn to be friends and get along oh, wait we're talking about the romans never does mind. that does that answer the question well yeah i mean he was he was the og genocidal maniac julius caesar i mean how Grace, many goals did, did he kill question? like over a million anyway yes we were talking about aughts earlier and i i thought just in my mind, I, I think oughts are, are generally outcome dependent, meaning we ought to do things if we want certain outcomes. I mean, that's that's pretty reasonable. I, I don't think it is. I think that, that just merely doing consequentialism will lead to sort of Machia, Machiavellian um, sort of outlook on, on society. Like, for instance, if, if you want to make some happy someone happy, if, if the consequence is there being happy, then why not just you know, feed them a whole bunch of happy drugs and sort of, you know, just make them happy against their will or, or you know. Do you guys not do that in Australia? Because we already do that here. Yeah, we do that here. Yeah, that's a... That's a context. I, don't, I don't think... That, yeah, I, I, I think we the intentionality would have to... Drugs. To, would have to play a certain part in it or at least the intentions to get a certain outcome like if you're trying to help and you do harm perhaps you still should have ought to done that um because you were trying to help even though um the consequences were bad so they actually there was well quite... i think what he's saying is that you're a, you're you're wanting certain consequences you can't control consequences but Correct. you're wanting certain consequences. Correct, yeah. So uh, they, there was a good thing about this on... Um, did anyone ever see The Good Place? It was a fantastic show. It was a really cool show. Yeah. Um, dealt I've a lot, seen The Good Place. Yeah, it dealt a lot with morality, but the whole problem there was that things were so complicated that nobody could ever predict the consequences of things, and so everything had bad consequences, ergo nobody could do good actions. And I think that is a well, valid... The elephant in the room, too. It also turned out to be hell. No, no. The whole point was everybody went to hell because nobody could outweigh the harm that they did through their actions with anything good because every single action would have multitudes of consequences down the line that were bad that you couldn't always predict. So nobody could be good. That was why every like nobody had been sent to the good place in, in forever kind of thing. What it was was it was saying, hey, um, you can't always know the consequences. So if you make a system purely based on consequentialism, there's going to be actions and a lot of them that are going to be, well, well that's wrong that you did that, even though you were trying to do your best. And I think that's a valid criticism of consequentialism. Well, I agree, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, our actions should reflect what we intend to happen or what we would like to happen versus yeah. what we can control will happen. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I have, a, I have a thing to say here. So, consequentially, Caesar had every right to cross the pomerium because they did not give him the parades that he deserved. Aiden, would you agree? 
They didn't. Okay, listen. Did they give Caesar the triumph that he deserved for his actions? The in three triumphs. Hey, the three hey. Triumphs. No, 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 no. Because the original, the original issue was over his triumph in Hispania, over his campaigns related to Lusitania. All right. That's so if you want to debate Caesar, you want to debate Caesar. Let's get the facts straight, Sonny Jim. <laughs> all right. But that being said, the three triumphs that Caesar asked for. Let's be honest, dude. Asia Minor triumph. Eh, was it really worth a triumph? And the North African triumph? That was against We're talking Romans. about that was against Caesar. That was against fellow Romans. The North African triumph is literally a triumph that celebrates the death of fellow Romans. Why do you think it didn't go over all that well when he literally brought out giant murals that were displaying Cato ripping his bandages out after he stabbed himself and had tried to commit suicide? It wasn't exactly because in good it was taste. the point, Aiden. It wasn't he in was good taste, Christian. In that position and they tried to strip okay. him of it but he was a populist yeah. like JFK yeah. Caesarian thug Caesarian thug that's fine go ahead just wave that club around a little bit more please that's carry fine. on gentlemen <laughs> well I think that Caesar was fairly immoral I mean if you look at him he, <laughs> he, he, would judge him he did nothing wrong he did nothing wrong he did nothing wrong and I think that the my favorite my favorite biblical verse holds true to Caesar that money is the answer to everything because certainly uh, was it Cassius who supported him and was the richest man likely in history. If it was not for that infinite supply of money, that cheat code, uh, he, he wouldn't have been where he was. That's also true about JFK. And that's why Proverbs guy was arguing with me last time, but I think that is the best biblical verse that. Red is for feasting. What, what Wine makes the heart merry. Ecclesiastes uh, eleven and seven, I think. What's it say? Uh, bread is for feasting, and wine makes the heart merry. But money is the answer to everything. Mark, I have a question for you displayed upon the screen. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Okay, cool. Yeah, good question, Adam Law. Um, it depends on if it was decided by God, like it was God's um, judgment or opinion or what, what he designated in his mind, then it would still be subjective. It still starts dependent. The starts would be God's starts, but it still starts dependent. It would still be subjective. Um, now, you sort of could say, well, God's got domain over everything. Um, there's there's no problem with that. Well, yeah, but you're still saying that the one with the most power makes the rules. Um, if it's in God's nature, that's a different story because that might not be his mind deciding what it is. But then you've got problems again because then um, God's nature is something he doesn't have control over in that case. And if that's the case, then God isn't all powerful and, and doesn't even have control over his own nature, which is a, a bit of a problem. Um, so I think I think um, I would say subjective for that particular one, but it depends how you're using um, the word decides there, um, whether it is, you know, something that God ha can will or God does not will. And I think that leads nicely into the question I want to ask Christian, which is sort of along the lines of the Euthyphro dilemma. Does God decide where morality comes from or does morality come from somewhere else? That's a very, you know, earlier you had asked me a question and we got distracted, but yeah, yeah. You, you were asking, if I remember correctly, the source of morality. Yes, right? yes. Yeah. So the point I was making earlier is that the only absolute morality that I believe in is God's instruction to the church. Everything outside of that is relativistic, and even the way that the church acts towards the secular world is relativistic, and it evolves with time. So where does it come from? Well, my understanding of the New Testament, which is admittedly limited, I mean, I'm, I'm barely 33 years old, so it comes from apostles. If you look at the ministry of Christ for three and a half years, it was written in the letters that he was the apostle and high priest of our profession, which meant that during his earthly ministry, he fulfilled the office of the apostle. After he was gone, his disciples took upon themselves the office of the apostle, and we know that they instructed things that were considered scripture, and those things included moral teachings. So an individual who fills the office of an apostle has the right to author scripture and imply moral teachings for the church. So I would say that they come from, naturally speaking, the lips of an apostle and spiritually the, the force that is inspiring that apostle that gave them that authority in the first place. Now, that probably doesn't answer the question to your satisfaction, but from a Christian point of view, I think you could say that morality comes from apostolic leadership. Well, that, that's a subjective thing, unless the force is actually the one that decides what 
what those lips say and the the uh, apostle uh, office of the apostle is just a conduit for that that designation of what is right and what is wrong then that's purely subjective and that that's not that's well i do think it's a bit subjective to be honest with you mark because like there are passages i don't have them all in front of me that that basically say that when a person is filled with the spirit of god and goes through the process of conversion that whatever they want is what God's want. God wants because they, their objectives become his objectives. Their desire of their heart becomes the desire of his heart. So when you say that this is what Peter wanted, that's synonymous with saying this is what God wanted after Peter's conversion. Um, well, I, I mean, that, that, that's, that's, that's definitely interesting. So um, how do they know what... Um, what um, whether what their subjective interpretation is is right or wrong and what 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 gives them that well there is know, no the... secular metric because it's not for the secular world like I, I remind people of this all the time when i'm speaking but the none of the letters in the new testament were ever written to the world they were never written to sinners they were never written to, to people in the world they were always written to the saints to those who have the spirit of god so there, there is no moral uh, commandment in the new covenant given to secular people. God has no interest in the secular world, the new covenant. People who have the spirit of God, there's a commandment given to them, and they accept the authority of the commandment because they are partakers with the same spirit that the authority came from in the first place, so they understand it within themselves. But the wait, other people don't understand it because they don't have that. Spirit. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Christian, but, but secular people no, still have to decide what's right and wrong. Like they've still got to no, make I don't, choices I don't believe in that kind of morality to do or ought not to do. Well, no, regardless of whether you believe in it, like me as a secular person, I've still got to decide what I ought to do and what ought not to do. And I'm wondering if not from my no, own... No, that's relativistic. So okay. hold on, hold on, hold on. So are you saying that there's like an unwritten book of rules somewhere? Who, me? Um, I don't have the question. Who are you asking that to, Dustin? I was asking Mark. No, I, I don't think there's an unwritten book of rules somewhere. No, I, I think that. So that... then, how, 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 how? Okay, so if there's if there's no like ultimate authority mm -hmm. that delineates what's moral and what's not. Yes. Right. Then I, I mean. Okay. That so... you, there's. I mean, it's kind of like kind of like this amorphous blob where you don't know mm -hmm. where. The bits of black and the bits of white go because everything's gray. Are you yeah. not an ultimate authority? So we we basically um, what happens is that we make social uh, groups, um, and that that social group, for instance, I base morality on well-being. Like my well-being is important to me. Other people's well-being is important to them. I, I don't know a human whose well-being isn't important to them. So from that that um it, it's called utilitarianism from that utility so you and i are in agreement on that mark i, I see like a secular morality problem well, exactly let, let me finish let me finish let me finish let me finish um from, from that utility of well-being i can then make some objective as long as we agree that our well-being is important and the well-being of society is important um which you know probably all of us agree on um, we can make some objective decisions about what is good and bad in virtue of that that goal right in virtue of the well-being of humans and society and so i get my morality from secular humanism basically saying humans require well-being human societies require well-being what are the decisions that i have to make to get us to that goal now if someone says well i don't care about my own well-being and i don't care about your well-being and i don't care about the well-being of society um there's nothing stop i don't think there's anything objectively stopping them from doing that but then they no longer will fit into our society because that's not what people hold to be valuable. Can I say something? Sure. I, I like to uh, put my position as a Christian because I think that Christian's position that he gave to you about uh, where does morals come from is tainted by the, uh, his belief in predestination. So I'm going to say that scripture says that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. So everything that's in that scripture, in that Bible, was given by God. So all these things come from God, whether New or Old Testament. 
they come from God. They don't come from apostles' mouths or, or anything like that. I just like to clarify that because okay. that, that's the truth of Scripture. So, but that would mean that God could change his mind, declare, you know, everybody under the age of 18 to be evil and that killing them is good and that would become a good thing. Yeah, God could do what he wants, but, he, but we have to understand the character of God, right? He's loving, he's caring, he's long-suffering. These are the characteristics of our God, and we're lucky to have him in well, that manner. But you also done say worse that God's the Old character Testament. is unknowable in a multitude of ways as well. And he's done worse question, before. Or? Well, as an internal critique, he's done worse before, right? I mean, he's killed off well, the what entire do you mean? human species at one point, except the eight people. Well, Scripture says that the, the, uh, their heart was on evil continuously. So you say that's bad, that is the heart was on, their hearts were on evil continuously? Or like Solomon Moore were, were uh, just lustful creatures that would try to rape anything that moved just about. Sure. See, that's, that's a problem for God. To but he could just decide that again, correct? But he uses the the character that he's a loving God, caring, long suffering. But that's why he sent his own son again. to die for us. I yeah, he could he could do what he wants. He's God, right? He could do what he wants. So sure. I, he's he's sure. he's a, he's the authority. But that well, not with the flood. Didn't he promise he would never would be, do that again? It would be against his character. He promised that's why he sent water. his son. That's why he sent his son to die on the cross. For yeah. Us. But, but because he, he is the character of loving and, and long suffering. But he that could do that again. Like, there there isn't right anything right. stopping him from deciding to do that again. And the problem then is because that becomes good. That is a good thing that he wipes out humanity. Well, let, let's say let's say this, Mark, that you make a game, right? And it's called uh, Mark's Game of of yeah. Marvels. And mm -hmm. so it's your game. If you want to play in this game, then yeah. you're going to follow Mark's rules, right? Mark changes whenever he wants. That's but but hopefully Mark's an honest, fair guy, and, and he doesn't do that to us. And we yeah. play the game and have fun and have and it's fair. That's how that's how I see it. Sure. But then then you've sort of got a a might makes right kind of morality that that if you've got the biggest stick then then you just get to decide what the rules are um and Amen. so that's the way it is yeah that's how life is right oh, isn't mean, that true it's true is is that no, the way that's life not is? true morality that's the survival of the fittest that's, actually that's, evolution says that right that's not I, I true morality know. though in the sense that you were the bigger all... the bigger stronger knocks out the weaker no so it's evolution that... that's not so how hold on, hold on. that's not how evolution works in social like sociality um so what what happens um, in social situations and social animals is that they work cooperatively to be stronger, right? So humans are very very frail, right? Humans are incredibly frail. There, there's you know not it, or nearly any animal can take us down, including a dog. Like we're we're very very frail um, as far as physiologically speaking. Um, but we're, we're cooperative, and that's the strength we have. We work together. And that's been the main source of our strength, whether that be passing on how to use tools, doing tasks in a coordinated fashion, um, that, that is actually our strength. So it's not the biggest and strongest. With, with particular organisms, it's the ones that can work together the best are the ones that are going to be the ones to survive. Well, well let's, let's take that same example. In, uh, and you're a, a group of people that live mm -hmm. in the, uh, let's say, the... Uh the Belgium area, right? And, and Nazi Germany comes along bigger, stronger, more mighty, and they come overrun you and destroy all your organization, all your sharing, all your nice things. They come and take it because they have they have the power to do it. Yeah. And they did that, in fact, in France, Belgium. So so all that goes out the window when the might comes in, then the right goes away. That's how it is. That's how life But that's God, uh, though. God is Nazi yeah. Germany in your example and the fact that God has the bigger authority. God has more power. So you, in your own example, would submit to Nazi Germany because Nazi Germany is the one that has more power. If God is the one that wields the ultimate power and authority over everything and you follow God because, as you just said earlier, he has that ultimate power, is that really truly faith at that point or is that just utilitarianism? No, that's you saying that I follow him for that reason. <laughs> That's no, what you that said is. that yourself earlier. I didn't say I follow literally... him because he's mighty. You, no, you no, 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 no. Aiden, 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 I got to clarify. He said that would be right because he's got the biggest stick. Not, oh, not that, that would follow. be right. So, I didn't say I follow him because I... Yeah, so when we're talking okay, about no, morality... That is fair. Like, he's basically I, saying... I apologize. No, 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 apologize. that's okay. It's I'm just, sorry. it's a very sort of slight di distinction between the two that he's saying that, hey, I would agree with God that that is the right thing to do because he has the biggest stick. But you do have a point, which is, well, why wouldn't you agree that for, for Germany? 
because your morality is based upon who's got the bigger stick. No, morality, morality is not based on that. I told you that God has a characteristic to him. He's loving, long-suffering. This is why, this is why he's, he's, he's right. He set these rules and he set them. We're lucky that he set them this way. Right, based the, on love. God the, is love, Scripture tells us. The analogy that you gave, though, about the game, right? About how um, the, Mark and his game that he sets up. So that the, the example that you give there is a paradigm that he establishes, right? Mm -hmm. So that is no different than if the Nazis go in. And if they establish their own paradigm, they establish their own way of doing things. And if they're ultimately more powerful, like in that example that you gave, then by that logic... You would have to obey Nazi Germany and what they do, because after all, that's the paradigm that they've established. Well, so no, let's just hope that they're Hold fair. on, Aiden. I, I get what you're saying. I think a better way to say it is that, that you could you could basically be against Germany, but then we would have an intellectual inconsistency, like one set of rules for God and another Essentially, yeah. Yeah, for, for what's being applied in, in every day. I think I think that's sort of what Aiden's getting at. Sorry, Aiden, I don't I don't mean to interrupt. Well, for me, I would never equate Nazi Germany with God. That's 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 definitely not something that you can compare. Those are well, not comparable. I think God probably yeah, all we're talking about people. is carnal carnal isn't people direct, on this earth. Isn't a direct comparison. We uh, all we're talking about is carnal carnal man on this earth under carnal situations where the power, more powerful can easily disrupt and destroy the people that are trying to do whatever they think is right over here as a group. All but they got to do is come in and do it. And we see it all the time. Can't we God see invasions of other lands we're over over borders. We see it all the time. It happened sure. right here in America. But can't God do that? Didn't God just wipe out the Canaanites and the Amalekites? Like, why, why is that any different? Because God's people, right? God's people are important to him, his children. Well, aren't that's the what? Nazis' people important to them? You sure? That's, that's, well, then but what's the, the I'm not comparing that to God. You are. What's I'm the not difference? comparing Nazis to God. Well, what's the difference? Uh, the, 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 the difference is that God has his people that he's going to take care of his children. So like you would take care of your children, right? Would you take care of your children? But the Nazis can difference. make that exact same argument that they have their people to take care of, their their Aryan race to take care of. They can make exactly the okay, same argument. Okay, but I'm saying... Can, I, comparing, can I jump in? No, hold on. We're, we're, comparing car, we're, we're comparing carnal things to God, right? The creator of all things, which we can't do. But if you, uh, you as, a carnal, as a carnal human being... You would protect your children, right? That's what yeah. I'm saying. So I didn't bring up the Nazis because of comparison. You, you, you did. No, no, I didn't. I, I bring up the purpose of Nazis as being on this carnal earth. Okay. Uh, might make right, and you're you're saying uh, so you human beings could just form these societies where they, everything is good. You know, agrees, and if you're not, they put you out. But all can we at that, least that, all agree that, that part of Nazis are, are bad? That. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I think they're shocking. Um, isn't that okay, what great. God does? Like, if if you don't agree, he puts you out or into a lake of fire. Rather, is, isn't that what he does? Does God do what now? I'm sorry, I missed oh. that. He does. You he said put you, you out? said like you could be put in a society by the Nazis, and if you don't agree, they would uh, put you out. They'd take you out, kind of thing. Well, isn't that what God does? Like, if you do don't the not, but do the Nazis do the Nazis have the, like the authority? To do that, yes. Other than you know, yes, who they, they who do. They have, yes, they have yes, the authority. No, they, they do not. The Nazis are not the creator of the, of the world and the universe and everything. No, but you're know. asking if they have. If the they power are not the creator. How do you guys them from their that? society? And they do. The creator have the of everything, right? Well, that we know. Is All right, bad. hold okay, on. It's Stump's defense. We really can't only hear one at a time. Well, let me finish then. God is creator of all things. He's not. He's not an individual country. He's not a man. He he is God of the creator made of the all comparison. things. Well, you it, it made sounds it comparison. sounds a bit like me to sort of special pleading, or at least at least maybe an intellectual inconsistency kind of thing. That that somebody being a tyrannical person that can make you submit or like have dire consequences is fine when it's a god but is terrible when it's a human and and that's you know you can you can believe that if you want i mean that that's oh, it fine. is it is because it's well, God let me finish it. let me finish he created let everything me finish. let me finish Wait, no, let, let me, me finish, finish. No, 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 let, let me finish all right hold let on finish. hold on hold on um, hold on hold on we're gonna let mark go like and then i'm gonna let christian intellectual chime intellectual in. nonsense you guys are bringing but go ahead well, well oh, it's just stop stop poisoning the well stump it, it, it just Guys, suggests in ahead, a certain Mark. way that, that sort of Christian. when you're talking about morals and oughts kind of thing, if you're going by, hey, um, morals are ubiquitous, like they apply to everything, um, it, it seems like you're, you're making an exception for God to be not moral, essentially. It, 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 the, the morality that he's laying on us is different than the, the morality that he has for himself. 
and that's fine but it just sort of it, it sort of if god decided that if we all killed one another that was moral that would become moral tomorrow that, that's the whole the problem in a nutshell right right some people don't want to have god over them they don't want to have any authority they want to do what they think is right they want to be the guy of their own world i understand that that's that's what you want that's to do that's not what he's saying you want that's exactly what what you guys okay. are saying you don't want any no, authority over you because you don't agree words into our mouth you may not agree so. with god okay i might be putting words in your mouth but i'm gonna tell you what, what my theory is about people who don't <laughs> don't want to submit the authority of god they want to be the god of their own world so you could be your guide of your own world and make your own little world and see, how, see how you do That's brother you stump let do him, me let a favor go 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 grab a, a small cup of I'm water sorry. and I'm drink sorry. the whole cup of water um i i got a, i got a question that might Ooh, stump me? you though i'm not yeah. the, i'm not the guy can like a clown and laughing at people uh, yeah, 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 that, that, well, yeah that, that could be disrespectful what you're saying is laughable well hold on i i do want to let christian in because he's been trying to chime in for a bit now And he's he's off on the Mongol if, steps. If Christian he's doesn't away come, the, I will speak for on, him. On the war pony. Oh no! Oh no! I laughed at Christian. Well, well, Sorry, I'm not trying hold, to be disrespectful, guys. Hold, I hold on, um, Dustin. Yeah. You've been quiet for a little bit too, and Grayson. You have. Go ahead. I, I, you picked the worst time to pick on me right now. There's going to be a lot of background noise. Uh, give me a minute. I'll come back. Okay, well, Grayson, feel free to say whatever's on your mind, as well, long was, as you do it from a position of a young Earth creationist. I mean, I could. I do have a bot. But, uh, I know. You have <laughs> a cheat sheet. Um, I, I, when it came to back to the Nazi situation, when it came to the Nazis, they had the power, but that doesn't necessarily give them the right or the authority. But no one can stop them. And in the, in the same nature, I suppose, not comparing God to Nazis, so let's get Nazis are gone. But if God created us, which I obviously don't agree with, and he is all powerful, then why we can dislike what he does, really, we have no control over it. Amen. And, uh, we can judge it based on internal consistencies, but uh, it doesn't seem like his nature applies to God and not necessarily morals. Morality seems to be something that applies to humans and not necessarily God, from what I understand. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't agree with that, but okay. I agree with the other oh. part. Well, cool. so you think God is subject to the same morals as us? Well, he sent his son to die for us, didn't he? I mean, I. He did. Does that well, mean yes, that according he's to the same morals? He did to save us, right, from our own destruction. So yeah, he applied. He said the, the the wage of the sin is death, and he sent his son to die for us to pay that wage. Well, I think it's fascinating, um, Stump. I, I I think it's absolutely fascinating because you sort of mentioned that oh, people were just trying not to be under the domain of God. Essentially, you want to be your own god, kind of thing. Um, is there any way? that that a person could remove themselves from the domain of god you could think you can yeah you can think in your own you mind that you can, you can. By saying there is no god yeah by saying there's no god now you just removed okay. yourself in your mind but if there is a god then you haven't but and i believe there is a god and you you believe there isn't so then, you removed yourself from the moment domain of god then the question is That's if there's the no works. way i can remove myself from the domain of god and you know that then why are you angry I'm not angry at all. Did I get the right I'm angry? I'm not angry. I'm just disgusting and passionate. A little passionate. fired up, I think. Um, maybe oh, yeah, because, up. you know, that's the nature of, of uh, discussing things. I'm not okay. angry at anybody. Okay. I'm, yeah, I, I, just, I just think it's kind of interesting that people seem to get like, oh, well, you, you, you're removing yourself from the domain of God when apparently that's impossible. So um, I, I want to ask are you, are you a person that thinks that a, a person automatically knows there's a God, like in a, in a sort of, presuppositional way like do you think that that you know people suppress their knowledge of god or do you think that i genuinely don't believe in a god i can't you know, here see here's the thing I, I i can't pretend to talk for you because my experience okay. is i've always known there's something going on uh, people mm -hmm. have different mindsets right some things some people have minds for a certain uh uh types of work they can do some can't do the same thing you know computer okay. programming maybe i don't have the mind for that so i can't say that i won't i won't say that Although, if you don't mind, Mark, can I ask yep. you a couple of questions concerning oh, of this? Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. I mean, I do take you as intellectually honest, and I think you do your studying. Why don't you believe, or, or do you believe in the possibility of a god? Um, do I believe in the possibility? So if you're talking about a logical possibility, like in some, some sort of um, 
far flung, you know, maybe it could occur. Maybe. I, I don't believe that a God exists. I, I actively do not believe it. Um, the reason why is um, because I've never been given any evidence for a start to believe there's a God. And and sort of more recently, um, in in learning about how minds work and and it's sort of the the, the systems that that the brain uses to make a mind um, and and all of that entails the vast complexity of it. I, I've never encountered a um, a mind without a brain, um, or at least some kind of physical medium to instantiate that mind. Now, um, that's a provisional belief. So I'm not saying it's logically impossible that there's a God, but I believe there is no God because I don't think a mind can exist without a brain. I, I believe that that's impossible. Um, so I think it's ontologically impossible, maybe not logically possible. Um, but that's that's essentially why. I think that if someone could show me a mind without a brain, I would certainly probably move to the agnostic side of things. Like I, I don't know whether one exists or not. But I think until that happens, I would have to say that to me, it seems like a disembodied mind or a mind with no um, brain is is sort of an incoherent statement. Robert, Scott, can I ask a question before you ask your next one? Yeah, go ahead, Grayson. This doesn't necessarily have to do with the God, but it seems like you think that a mind um, apart from a body is sort of uh, not possible, correct? Um, yeah, yeah, essentially. Hey, I'm back. Um, I'm, so I'm what not would sure you think what you about mean a by apart, brain. though, like apart from a, from a body. What do you mean by that? So, like, a, are you familiar with the concept of a Boltzmann brain? Uh, yeah, Ooh, brain I in a vat kind one. of thing, yeah. Absolutely. Well, a Boltzmann brain is just, a, right, a brain that assembles itself sort of from yeah. from material things, from nothing, but is is sort of in the cosmos. What Do you yeah. do you think that is a, uh, a possible? I'm not saying it's a god, obviously, but uh, it yeah, is a yeah. brain um, without a body. Is that possible? Um, I think it's I think it's more possible than a god, but I I also yeah I, I think that it, yeah it is possible. Um, I, I think that um, if you're going into hard solipsism, I I'm not sure I have the time for that, but yeah I can go there. Sure. Oh, I'm not a hard solipsist. I'm I'm a theist. Well, I think I think that I wouldn't say I'm a hard solipsist, but I have to I have to sort of I have to give solipsism its due. Well, you oh, can't just no. prove it, that's Mark. for sure. <laughs> Mark, okay, yeah. well, you did say you're not a hard solipsist. Correct, yeah. yes. Okay, well, we can... well, it's just one of those things you can't escape. Correct. I mean, you could, yeah, you can argue against it, but it is, I, it is sure. always yeah, looming. Sure. But... Welcome back, Christian Pike. Yeah, I, I don't yeah, sorry, think I would sub like, I wouldn't submit failure. to it, but I do acknowledge its um, inescapability. I suppose I would just sort of acknowledge um, sort of the, the, the Munchausen trilemma um, the the sort of the inescapability of, the, of those three prongs seems to um, trip me up at the moment. So yeah, I think it's um, Grayson. I think it's interesting what you brought up about the the Boltzmann brain. Boltzmann and, brain, yeah. Um, yeah. Right. I well, I, that... I say that because, like I said, I I am a theist, but I the God I believe in does not have omni properties and is physical. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, what problems would you have with my type of God? Um, so what um, what do you mean by physical? Uh, is is there any sort of supernatural element at all? Negative. She create. I believe that we live in a simulation that was created by her, but okay. it's identical to base reality. Wait a minute. You said she helped you win the lottery. I didn't say that. That's not what I said. I said well, you, I was given you said information she helped you come into money, though. I yes, I, this is correct. I was given information, but I also that's kind of miraculous. I but. I am not a Christian, so I can admit that it could be pure luck that I made these I made these gambles and profited all of them. Has, <laughs> has so, yeah. you got super, me, Grayson? You has, got me. Is this supernaturality where you hang well, your well, head? Well, hang on a second. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I got one question. Has the agent got any um, any? Can can the agent take any actions on the simulation that would be outside of the rules of the simulation and unexplainable by the people in the sim simulation? Uh, could but would not. I have been wanting. Well, if it could, then then I have been waiting to ask you no, this question. I, I mean, I guess I mean, in what in what sense do you mean? Because the simulation well, is set up to mirror base reality, so yes. that we can learn what it is to be in base reality. Okay. 
So if the simulation has the laws of base reality, then anything supernatural would be defined as something that violates those laws and are completely inexplicable to the laws even now or at any point in the future. So in that case, supernatural would be the ability to, not access necessarily the exercise of, but the ability to change that simulation without adhering to the laws of that simulation. I would say that the ability, but not the will, is there. Okay. Because well, I would she certainly... is in control of the simulation, thus she could change the rules of simulation, but she wouldn't. Right, right. No, I get that. I get that. But it's, it still sort of falls under that supernatural. Look, I think that that... that... Well, oh, does it, if you're allowing for the idea that it's a simulation, then how does it fall under supernatural? Well, because the, the simulation, so so natural would be the, the laws of nature. So, no, I get that, but you're acknowledging it as a simulation. But I guess it would all well, be natural it's, it's because she'd be doing it in base reality I don't, through correct, natural means. Exactly so that's right. our reality. Yes. I, I, don't, yes. I don't think it's a simulation. I don't think reality is a simulation. I don't think the world universe around us is a simulation. I'm just doing no, I don't either. I mean, it's just for sake of the argument, right? Right, right. Just doing an internal critique. And so a, simul a, a supernatural would be in violation of um, the laws of of nature not just our laws that we've written not just the laws of physics that we've written down but in violation of the in intrinsic sort of um rules of the universe if you will and that's how i'm sort of equating it to this simulation idea so um that's what i would i mean di people different people have different ideas of what supernatural is i get that that would be my so idea let me and then Let I'm, me I'm object into what hold, I hold it, Grayson. I really want to explain ahead, this. I'm, I'm trying to line that up with how it would fit into simulation theory. Um, and it's not a, it, it's, it's very hard to get that across, sort of to, to get supernatural in our world to um, outside the rules of the simulation. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it's kind of, that's the best way I could see it. So I guess what I mean by that, so let's say in base reality, it would be impossible for God to completely stop time. It's something she lacks the capacity to do because time cannot be completely stopped. However, because we are in a simulation, she could stop our simulation, which right. from our perspective would stop time. Right. So while that does not violate base reality, it would violate, it would violate base reality, but not our program. So would right. that be supernatural? It's supernatural in oh. virtue of our perspective, but it's not in virtue of their perspective because their natural is, is base or what I would call absolute reality, the external reality to the simulation. So it would be supernatural to us but it wouldn't like so that would be a god to us. Well, how how do we even yeah, know that this? How do we even know yeah. that this this entity that's controlling this simulation? How do we know that that itself is not simulated at that point though? When you come, when you bring up simulation, there you go. the simulation hypothesis, yep. there you go. there's no way at that point to verify the actual integrity of what you're in because statistically Correct. speaking, if you are if the, if it is possible. For you to simulate the universe on a one-to-one -one reality, if that is in fact something that humanity eventually will be able to do, then it's not only possible that we are within a simulation, yes, Christian, it's you're next. probable that we're uh -huh. within a simulation. And it's probable so, that the that people point, doing the simulation are within a simulation, yeah. Yeah, exactly, that's yeah. what I was about to say. It just, it, it ends, it goes down an endless... It's turtles, of things. So, all the way down. It is turtles all the way down, but I don't disagree with that, and even, sure. I would say that God's answer to that would be, she cannot be certain. But she has a single goal, which is to run nurture simulations. How could you make be sure? certain? Because when she you're in a post scarcity society, machines do almost all of the work for you. And so the only thing you need people for is to monitor those machines. And you must have people that follow certain ethical principles because well, they, the capacity of damage the they can do is too high. Well, just one more thing, really quick question. Uh, if that's the case, though, if what, you're if what you're saying is true and she truly can't know that, then you're in possession of some sort of esoteric knowledge that this deistic creator of the universe itself doesn't have access to at that point. So then wouldn't you necessarily, by that logic, have a one-up over this this creator? Over she is also not, I am aware I'm in simulation and she is not aware if she is or is not. That's exactly what I mean, yes. No. Well, it would, though, because you would then buy... She's not an omni-god. She doesn't have omni-properties, and thus it, there's but no contradiction in her being they... uncertain of something. Yeah, and I'm not saying that it's necessarily inherently a contradiction. What I'm trying to say, though, is is that it's interesting to me that by the virtue of you, even if they aren't omniscient, that still means that they're the creator of things and still don't possess a fundamental 
bit of knowledge about the reality with but which I am still in the same okay. position, sir, right? I don't I have that Christian same knowledge really about fundamental reality. Something all right, all right. Hang, hang, like, hang tight, yeah, everybody. Sorry, Christian, sorry. Christian, you have the floor. Okay, this is a little off subject, so I apologize for that. I'm sorry, um, Christian. I will say, uh, first and foremost, this conversation is certified bonkers, and I'm enjoying it. But what I'm actually uh, taking the floor because of is I wanted to circle back around to Stump earlier Stump had wanted to make a clarification that his understanding of morality, biblically speaking, was not the same as mine. And I think he had associated mine with predestination. I wasn't sure. But I wanted to see where Stump and I differ on that because I found it curious. I can attempt to speak for Stump. Uh, <laughs> Captain, you there? Did he get that drink of water? Thanks, Stump. Stump. <laughs> That great drink of water. He's been guy. stumped. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't laugh. It's I mean, I've been streaming for four hours joke. now. I've had to sneak away a couple times. Mark, I'm not. I'm not the most tasteful of people. No, I'm sorry. Okay. If you haven't already Can we all? Look, can someone we all laughs at my dad joke. I'm, I'm you good. are. I love nice you, buddy, guy. but you, you definitely have like a, a, a pinch of pepper. What's that, sir? Pinch of pepper. A pinch of pepper. I love uh, you. Yeah. I, I heard something very different there. I'm very glad that you clarified <laughs> that. You said he's got a pinch of salt and pepper? Something along those lines. Well, that's good, those probably. Lines. That adds flavor to your life. It absolutely does. I mean, come on. Do you really I got want... Texas Pete myself. Don't put it on your brain, though. It's not It's not good for it. I wouldn't recommend it. Um. So Stump is gone, which is a clear concession. Um, of course. Right. Steve He's predestined to be gone. On his behalf because I, honest to goodness, don't even know where he is. Um, I was kidding. I don't even know exactly <clears throat> where he would stand that well, would differ from you or how well, I, it was well, related point, to predestination. Yeah, I don't know what that was, but my point was that I think that the New Testament gives us precedent to say that church morality comes from apostolic authority, and apostolic authority obviously comes from the highest ministerial calling of the Holy Ghost. And so, does he not agree with that? Is there is there people who call themselves Christians I who don't, don't agree with that sort of thing? I agree with that, Christian. I, I think that if you... But you're not a Christian. Well, Mark. but if you believe in predestination, how is there morality at all? Like, because if you can't decide yeah. anything... Yeah. So wait, weird. hold up, hold up. Mark, Um, I'm, I'm going to need you to honor... This is going to be kind of like Patreon. If you want to continue okay. the conversation with Christian at this point... You have to convert first, okay. and then we'll let you get in there and finish it. Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, it's I'm, I'm gone, guys. See ya. I, I gotta go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nah. Don't do it, Mark. Oh, uh, dear. Um, no, I, I, I think Turn that... Back. Yeah, so so there's... That was a great question. Yeah, so, uh, so you know, so with, with, with um, predestination, and if God um, decides what sort of... how What the outcomes are going to be to everything and you can't make a choice of any other possible world, then morality, to me at least, wouldn't wouldn't exist because you can't actually make a choice of what ought to be done. What is done is what ought to be done for everybody, everything, anything that happens in the universe. Okay, let me respond to that because that, to me, is uh, a really great question, to be honest with you. Sure. Um, that's a question I'm actually excited to respond to. Um so when I was speaking of morality, I was trying to make a statement based on the subject matter that was on the floor, which is how do human beings decide what's right or wrong, what they ought to do and ought not do. So I was making the distinction from God's perspective, according to the scriptures, that God could care less what the world does because he's going to burn it anyways. The only thing that he's interested in is what the people who are filled with his spirit are going to do or not do. So that being said, I'm like you or I'm, I'm like your example. I don't really believe in morality in the traditional sense. I believe in determinism. But if we're speaking of how do we organize a society and what kind of rules and regulations and expectations do we place in that society, that's a very different question from what is the root and end of all things. Okay, right? hold on. Hold on one second. Um, because I think Stump is back. And Christian, I know you wanted to ask a question to Stump. Yeah, but also Dustin really wants to talk to Mark too. Sure. I'm back. Go ahead. Okay, so Christian, you want to go ahead? Yeah, a Stump, I was just, earlier you had made a statement, you wanted to clarify that your understanding of biblical morality was different than mine, 
and that you felt as though predestination had somehow tarnished my view. And I didn't even realize that there was anything I said that you and I actually differed on. So I was just curious as to the details on that. Well, I, I thought you said that the, uh, the morality, or, or not the morality, but the rules, let's say, put forth from God was from the apostle's mouth and not from God, not inspired by God. Well, the I think the clearly apostle's says mouth that, is uh, God's mouth, don't you? Well, scripture says that uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. I don't, if, if that's what you believe, I don't think you made it clear. I could be wrong, but, but you know. Well, I was saying that from a New Testament perspective, it's the writings of the apostles that give us our standards in life. Well, it still goes comes back from God. He gave the inspiration. In other words, he's, they were the instrument, right? They were the pen that they wrote down God's word. Yeah, I think honestly, some I think that's a bit of semantics. I was just curious if there's any real like like theological disagreement there, and I also didn't understand the connection with that and my belief in predestination. Well, because then if there, for me, if there's predestination, then God is a tyrant, because He's saying, uh, for instance, Mark, you're not gonna be, you can't be my child. Well, you're going to hell. I just put you in this game, this similar, whatever you call it. For you to go to hell but uh proverbs guy you're my child don't worry about it you're gonna get there in the end you're gonna go to heaven that's 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 being a tyrant to me it is it is being a tyrant in the literal sense because the, he is removing choice at that point he's removing the ability of his creation yeah I mean, if that's what being to a be tyrant able to means. choose yeah then i believe he's a tyrant if that's what that means in fact i like i'd like to debate you on this uh christian when we get a chance and i'd like to do a formal yeah. one Sure. Our, with, with scripture, and we can uh, decide. Yeah, Everybody I wasn't going to use anything else. Right, amen. So I have to set up a, a debate between Christian and Stump and Christian and Mark? No, Christian and Aiden. Christian and Rome. Aiden on Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar. Christian and Aiden. Yeah. Oh, hey, that'll be a fun one, too. I could do Roman general. Either one would be really cool. This, this guy thinks he knows about Julius Caesar. Yeah, you think you know about Julius I, Caesar. I got a feeling a whole here. lot of you know studying what? about Julius Caesar is going to be going on in the next next week or so. <laughs> <laughs> this, guy, this guy knows about as much about Julius Caesar as one of the pirates that tried to act like, oh, he's so funny trying to ask for twice as much silver in his ransom. Oh, that was he's such a funny guy. Yeah, he, he's about, he knows about as much of Julius Caesar as one of those Sicilian Yeah, and this, and this guy over here is, is pretty much right about that. You know, Christian, I don't know if it'll ever help you. I don't know a whole lot about Julius Caesar, but if you ever need a question answered regarding King Arthur, I'm your guy. Nice. Avalon. Dead it up. Um, I Avalon. Think, I think um, um, Dustin <laughs> wanted to ask me something, actually. Yes. Dustin. So, got the floor. okay. Reality, right? Mm -hmm. Um when we're dealing with moral systems yep. being invented, an invention has to be widely accepted, correct? An invention has to be widely accepted. I'm not. I'm not sure I would uh, agree with that. Right. I mean, somebody's probably invented a, an automatic, you know, skin cleanser or something. It's not wide. I'm not sure what you mean by widely accepted. Archimedes invented so, the So, I mean, when we're engine. talking about morals, right? right. So, like, you did the dog That's widely accepted. The what, sorry? It's an idea that was invented. The, I looked the, at that popular. It was an idea that came uh, Sorry, like, I'm having a lot Dustin, of you. Yeah, Dustin, you're breaking up really bad, man. Uh, I, I didn't hear your example. I'm sorry, I got a bad connection. Um, the what was okay, so widely... like the idea of stealing, right? Stealing, like don't steal my stuff. Yeah, it's accepted widely, right? Like you, that that's that's a bad to walk into cool. somebody else's house. Yeah. Okay, and that was an in system, correct? Well, I I I don't think that was invented. I think that that's a consequence of people wanting the society to be an ordered society where where they don't get things stolen but moral systems are invented well i think the um the the um yeah well moral systems are invented sure sure yeah so where where do you where do you draw the boundary line there i mean like okay i'll give you an analogy okay mm -hmm. Um, systems in the human body, right? When they're when they're operating healthy, mm -hmm. they don't 
become malignant and attack each other, like in the case of cancer, yeah. right? But the cancer doesn't know that what it's doing is killing its host, right? So it can't make up its mind that what it's doing is immoral, right? But then you take the same idea and you put it in a human concept of like, don't steal my stuff, right? And then all of a sudden a consequence is implemented. Although in some cases, I guess the human body does like fight against cancer. So, I mean, my, my analogy is kind of flawed, but I'm trying to see where you would draw the boundary line there. Between like what? boundary between what? So like you like if the system of morality is invented, right? Is there a boundary line between the the immune system and doing what it's supposed to be doing? Consider it that like the system in check has its own system of like morality, for example. Okay. Right. right. So in comparison. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think the, the, the point is that, yeah, the, the moral system is invented, but what's not invented is the, the physical um, emotions that we get. So there's this whole idea of empathy and reciprocity. They're not invented. And, and the, so the, the, the feelings that we get of social cooperation and and the fact that we're just physically weak, so we need to cooperate to succeed in this world, that's not invented either. That's just a thing. But I don't think that rises to the level of a moral system. Like, yeah, we've got to work together, but it doesn't tell us what we ought to do in society or to make that society work or, or to survive. And I don't think there's even anything objective saying we have to survive. It's just those are the things that that's the hand we've been dealt kind of thing. Um, it's up to us to invent systems to be able to work together um, in, in society. But that's the tools that we have. Um, it's like um, um, you're, you're a carpenter, right? And you want to build something. A perfect for, for the Christians, carpenter, build something. Um, you know, you might have a hammer and some nails and some wood. They're not invented. But whatever you do with them is the invention. Does that make sense? Is that sort of getting at what you're you're trying to say? So the components of the invention are not necessarily greater than the whole of the invention. The well, no, no, I, I don't think that's the case of anything really. Um, the components of something are greater than the sum of its parts. Usually, yeah. Um, I mean that's not necessarily true as well. That the the, the, the sum is always greater than the, the the total is always greater than the sum of its parts but you're sort of talking about emergent systems of putting components together and getting something that works as a whole so there's something called the composition division fallacy that when you try to take little parts and say well that's how the whole works that that's a fallacy right it, it just means that um, things put together have their own properties rather than the properties of the individual parts. Like if you broke me down into cells, right, or atoms, say, atoms, even better. I see what you did there. What? Um, I see what you did there. Uh, and also, see, we would no, never I'm, do I'm that to you, Mark. With you. Well, if you broke me down to atoms, there, there wouldn't be anything what you're that, saying. that's Mark, right? There wouldn't be anything that's Mark. Like if you broke down empathy into just bits and feelings here and there, you wouldn't have yeah. anything. But what we do is we can take that and build a moral system with it. So it's the moral system that's invented, but not the actual tools that we're using to build it. I, I hope that I, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm not I'm not exactly sure what you were getting at, but I think I think I'm trying to address what I think. Well, you were I, at. What I'm getting. Well, no, you, 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 you struck the core. Right. But then there, okay. there's just one little issue. OK. Um, like so you're saying that this grand system is designed Okay, out of out of necessity, um, who's flying the ship? We all are. Well, okay, but then, like, uh, that's that's kind of a misnomer, though. I think you have to agree because we see examples where um, extreme. Uh, how do I put this? Where people are caught for doing things. See, this is one of the reasons why I, I hate not being able to swear. Uh, 
where people are caught for doing atrocious things, but they get let off the hook, right? I mean, that's – that's. Yeah. I, you know, I don't necessarily believe that everybody has an equal say, right? Like, I mean, I could bring up a couple of examples, but I think you sure. understand what I'm saying. Sure, yeah. No, I get what you mean. I, I mean, like, by we do, I mean, we – we have the system of sort of propping up where we think that what we want and what we don't want as a member of that society. Like, I, I think you'll struggle to find a human that doesn't care about their well-being. Like, just does, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong, there's probably certain people out there that don't, but they're usually sort of fringe cases kind of thing. Most people do, like, want to at least feel... Um, and there's certain things in psychology, um, sort of a kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But, um, you know, you've got your physical needs like food, water, shelter, things like that. People want those. That's what they want. Um, but then you get the other things like a feeling of safety, security, um, self-actualization, which is, is basically um, improving yourself to the fullest that you can be. All these things we know from, from psychological studies and, and, and psychoanalysis are integral to the well-being of the human. Um, and that's what I base it upon. That's, that's how people generally... We kind of understand what makes people happy, you know, sort of being acknowledged, being, you know, there's all of these things that, that we want. So um, I guess it's, it's society seems to be an open discussion about how we get people what they want and, and the best things out of, out of life um, and whether, you know, what strategy. But don't get me wrong. Like, Dustin, I don't expect everybody to follow my moral example. Like I said earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm happy if we're just morally compatible. If what I want for my well-being and the well-being of society essentially matches yours, it doesn't matter where you're getting your morality from to me. You know, if you treat people with respect and care for them and, and do good things that I see as good, I, I, don't, I don't care that that comes from a God. I, I don't care. That what, what's important to me is the actions being performed. There's only one thing that I would uh, bring up as, I don't know, necessarily a response. We saw the consequences of the ideals and principles that base this moral system out of invention and necessity when we looked at the french revolution we saw exactly what happened under those principles yeah well yeah. i mean do you do you do you den do you deny though that the french Re i'm not trying to act like the french revolution as a whole was as a total force for for good by any means yeah. whatsoever but the french revolution certainly did bring about some very very important needs that needed to are some reforms that needed to be addressed within the french uh within the bourbonic kingdom at that point in time i mean you look at the the third well, state and how it was I mean, treated if, at that point if your argument is that the, the the ends justify the means i can understand that argument but i mean that's a pretty bloody way to make a point. It's not, even, it's not even an ends justify the means argument. It's more a matter of looking at the what actually occurred from the French Revolution in terms of the reforms that happened, in terms of the biggest consequence, arguably, of the French Revolution, which was Napoleon. So I, I want to look at when you. Yeah, I want to address this ahead, just Mark. slightly. So, so Dustin, I, I I do agree that the the way that they carried out that was was a moral kind of like so just. They could have done it differently, um, that, um, you know, not killing and not, not doing the, the things that they did to bring about that change better. So there was a more moral action to be had in that circumstance. However, the, the aristocracy continuing and letting the people starve was immoral as well. Okay, so... Um, like I said, morality is so complicated, and of all of these actions, they probably didn't choose to one with the optimum amount of mor morality, but they certainly um, couldn't keep going on like they were, and that you know that system would not be moral because their well-being was you know being absolutely like the, the people were literally starved. 
Hey, fellas, I hate to cut it off, but no! I'm going on over uh, four totally hours and four hours, 20 minutes. Yeah, totally no, I, I, I understand as well. Yeah, Steven, yeah. Um, it's, it's been, it's been good being here as always. You know, I, I come back here for a reason, Steven, even though we've got our disagreements and everything, it's always a fun group of people to be around. I guess even Mark as well, begrudgingly. Even Mark yeah, <laughs> okay as well. Shocker. But... Shocker. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it's, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. It was, it was a really great talk. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Even, even the solipsism stuff, which that, it, it is a rabbit hole. It, it's a massive rabbit hole. Like it, it goes down. Um, uh, uh, wrapping my head around that was so hard to do. Um, yeah, just just incredible. But um, I think I think morality is one of those things where I love to talk about. And look, I, I'm always open to being convinced that that a, a different moral system is better. Um, but at the end of the day, as long as we can live together cooperatively, that that's good enough for me. I just want to stress that. You know, I'm not saying that anybody has to follow my morality or, or you know you have to follow this morality or that morality it's just it, i don't think it's necessary i would like an answer to uh, just a quick question and maybe it's not a yes or no and if it isn't then we'll talk about another time but do you think for any given action mark that there is a morally correct or morally perfect uh solution i think there is morally optimal sort of so so optimal. um in virtue of of my my meta-ethical standard which is the well-being of humans and society i think there'll be one action that is optimal whether we even know what that is or not whether we um so so it's a bit like epistemology ontology right like there might be an optimum right. solution but we'll never know if it is the optimum solution right because you know there's if you take one action there's no counterfactual for the other right because Oh, sorry, no counterfactual for that action because you don't know what happened on the other action. Um, there's a whole Correct. sequence of events that could happen that would make that one the bad one. So I, I think there's a mor morally optimal one, but we can only do what we think is going to be the best outcome. Do you think that there are like degrees of morality then? So there is, op I agree, yes. I think there is a morally optimal one. I don't know if we would know yes. what it is. It is possible that we do it, but we wouldn't know that we did it. I think some um, things are um, morally um, virtuous and morally necessary. Like, for instance, um, not killing somebody is a moral necessity. Like, so murdering somebody in society. I think I think that's a necessity in order to be. As soon as you start violating some rules, you are definitely being immoral. There's no doubt about it. Um, I think that some things are morally virtuous. So if I decide to donate a ton, like, you know, almost all of my money and live in extreme pro poverty, I think that's a virtuous action. But I don't think that makes you immoral. I think that's a, a you know, not a moral necessity kind of thing. Right. So I think there definitely are levels to morality. And, you know, as I said, it, it's insanely complicated. I agree. I have a uh, question for you. you, Mark, real quick before we go. Just real quick. You've got to let um, Stephen get to bed at some yeah, point. Yeah, Stephen's got a fire. I, I actually, I, I was going to offer Aiden one more closing thought <laughs> anyway. So go ahead, Aiden. Oh, I it, want it's, one too. It's, it's not even anything that's okay, long. Stump. I was, I was just going to ask Mark. Um, are, are you a fan of Frank Herbert's Dune series at all? I are haven't read it. The... I've only seen the film, so I have not read that uh, that book. Um, it's one that I always want to get round to, but I never got round to it um i've heard yeah, that it's should. insanely good I, I really should you're right it's just time because it is a long Fair series enough. and i i i, I feel oh, like it is well i feel like i'm gonna read the first one and just get addicted and you know it, it's a lot of <laughs> so i'm thinking it's a big time commitment even though you know ah, oh, grace and neuromancer is fantastic look william gibson i am a massive massive fan i i think william gibson is amazing yeah, it's it, you're definitely right about it being addictive. It's like twenty five. The entire series is like twenty five hundred pages of yeah. just some of the densest world building that you've Aiden, ever seen. Aiden, didn't so. you go to like some extraordinary length to get like first editions or something? I did. Yes. Okay. So yeah, I've got a signed copy of God Emperor of Dune from Frank. Oh Herbert, wow! And then I've got a first edition of uh, Children of Dune. Uh, almost got almost got one for Dune Messiah, but somebody outbid me. But I've got first edition book clubs of Dune and Dune Messiah and first editions well, of all the other ones. My so, yeah. pride and joy is is a signed copy of a Terry Pratchett book and that was hard to get. That that's my yeah. that, that's the pinnacle of my collection. 
when you, especially uh, authors that have passed away, I'm sure you yep. know their signatures aren't exactly cheap. So, yep. <laughs> but hey, I just figured I would ask uh, Stephen. Like I said earlier, thank you so much for yeah, having me on. It's been really great conversation. Um, have a good night, everybody. Not Stump, you had a closing I, thought. No, no, no I, I'm good. Uh, good night, brothers. And good night, Stump. Take care, mate. Right. And, and right. Dustin, thanks for having us, Grayson. Um, yeah, really good, good, good to be. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you all. Yep, have a good one. Uh, well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I wanted to say something. Sure. Hey, Mark. Yeah. Uh, it's it's always really interesting to talk to you, man. You get the the bits of gray matter going. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, Aiden, uh, much love, and uh, thanks again, well. Stephen, for having me on. Thanks for engaging no with the... me, Dustin. I, I know, I much know. Much love, stop. Yeah, I know I can, I, I, I sort of, I, I think okay. about things way too much, so I know I might I might talk about stuff way too much and stuff, but I, I, I've thought so much about this, it, it's very hard to stop my brain going, so uh, thank you for indulging me, I really appreciate it, and and of course, you know, thank you for sharing your worldview with me, and, you know, I, I, I do appreciate that, I love to get new perspectives. Um, I, I don't think I've converted yet, but, you know, <laughs> not quite not quite but you know that's okay that that's fine I I, I I i sort of you know i criticize other people's um perspectives but i don't mind if they criticize mine that's perfectly fine you know if, if you that's believe fair. um I'm, I'm going to hell and stuff it doesn't it doesn't worry me in the, at all like i know that some atheists get upset um i think that that sort of there's some reasons for that but that doesn't doesn't worry me in the slightest so um i, I don't like being preached to um, but, you know, if you want to talk to me about what you believe, go for it. I'm more than happy to have a conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, speaking of I, that, I, Mark, I would at one point like to... You bless this channel, man. And I know there's a lot of believers out Debatable. there that <laughs> almost... <laughs> uh, a lot of believers out there, they almost want atheists to go to hell, and that's not my heart. Okay. Like, oh, I, it grieves yeah. me, the thought of it. There's some people, man. No, Look, I agree with you there. There's some people well, that people, really, people, yeah, people say bless you and stuff. I, I I take it as the intention is is good kind of thing. I I get that. I just I just you know, and I'm not saying this to be insulting. I just don't believe you. That's all. Um, so I'm not. Yeah. You know, I don't believe that. So, um, and I'm, I don't mean that to be insulting. It's just yeah, I don't see any reason to believe it. And that that's it. Sorry, Aiden. I didn't mean to cut you off, mate. No, that's okay. I believe you should answer my email I sent to you. Yeah, I owe you I an believe. email. I absolutely do. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I I definitely will. I'm joking. Don't worry. I'm just. No, I feel bad worry. about it. I've, I've been so busy. I, actually, yesterday I was on like three streams. I've been crazy and I've got to upload everything. Wow. So, um, yeah, yes. I've got some work ahead of me today. So, um, but this was great. If you ever do one of those, if you ever do one of those live uh, hangout style things on your show, you ever mind if I pop in? Oh, of course not. Everybody's welcome. If I've got an open mic going, come come on in. And and you know, if I'm I'm doing something like with a, a review or something, I'll certainly I'll shoot you that email. And and um, if I'm doing a sounds review good. or something, I will I will hit you up. Not a problem at all. Hey, sounds good, man. All right. Well, have a good night, everybody. Take care. Yeah, all right, right everybody. Bye -bye. Good night. Good night. I want to give Good a big night. thank you to every single channel member who does so much to help me and the community have a fantastic time and keep producing more content. Thank you so much, everybody.